Okay. Yeah, thank you.
calling people versus James Crumbly, case number 22279-989-FH. Thank you. Good morning. Mark Keith, on behalf of the people. Good morning. Karen McDonald, on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. David Lynch, on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman, on behalf of James Crumbly, who is standing to my left. Good morning. Mr. Crumbly, can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right. You can be seated. Um, I was here last night, and I have a few rulings for you. The first would be about, I believe, about Exhibit 45, 52, and 62. And those all have to do with texts from the shooter uh, to Jennifer Crumley during uh, time periods when uh, the defendant and his wife were also taking photos of themselves at a, at a horse farm uh, together. At least that's what the metadata and the GPS shows. So I reviewed uh, 62, 52, and 45, and the court finds that the, those uh, texts would not be admissible because they are between the shooter and his mother. There's no information um, whatsoever, with the exception of the, the fact that uh, dad is with uh, his wife. Uh, at, as uh, demonstrated by pictures and texts and GPS and metadata and all those things, all those tools that are being used by the prosecutor's office to, to track people's movements in this case. Uh, so they are together, but there's no evidence whatsoever that Dad was on the receiving end uh, of that text. And in fact, I know that in both 52 and 62, the statement from Jennifer Crumley appears, where's your dad? So. Um, I, I don't find that there is uh, enough support uh, to believe that uh, Mr. Crumley um, was aware of these texts. He could have been aware of these texts. Um, we just don't know. And because of that, those uh, texts will not be admitted. And that also makes, uh, a, I think, some of the information at the horse barn um, inadmissible. Uh, clearly, if, if Mr. Crumley were to testify or if it became relevant, I, I can see the prosecutor saying, well, do you raise horses? Uh, were you, did you spend a lot of time with your wife horseback riding, whatever it might be? So the pictures of the defendant and his co-defendant at the horse farm might be relevant and might come in for other reasons. But the text between the shooter and his mother uh, will not be admitted because there's no evidence that the defendant uh, knew about those. So that's that. Um, I think you then asked me about uh, Exhibit 78. Exhibit 78 is in uh, conversation, I don't recall if it's Instagram or it's text. text. Yes, sir. And it's between the shooter and his friend. And it's a text that says, hey man, times have gotten rough. Ever since you left, I don't know if you're dead or you moved away, but I hope you're doing well. I'm about to do something really bad, and there's no turning back, so I'll probably never be able to see you again. I hope the best for you, and I'm sorry for anything I've ever done. And that's dated November 30th, 2021, at 821 in the morning, uh, the date of, of the shooting. And it's uh, to uh, the shooter's uh, friend, who's been previously not identified by name, but identified in this case. So I read a series of cases, including the case submitted by uh, the prosecutor in this matter, um, to indicate that there is an ex exception in this matter. Um, that there's not, uh, that this is not hearsay evidence. But I read a series of cases interpreting uh, that issue. And um, one of those is People, People versus Stubble. I think it's 149 ish at 42. In that case, hearsay <coughs> testimony was given by a prosecuting witness who testified that the defendant had approached her several times to discuss prostitution. And in that matter, um, the challenge to the evidence concerning the witness's testimony that one of the older men propositioned her friend. So the, uh, this text in Exhibit 78 is offered uh, by the prosecution under 8033. Uh, 
8033 applies if it is an exception to the hearsay rule if the declarance, declarant state of mind is at issue in the case. Um, that's also stated in People versus Lucas 360 Northwest 2nd 162. Also a Michigan case. This one's from 1984. People versus Lucas. That also says the court's ruling that the testimony was admissible under the state of mind exception to the hearsay rule pursuant to MRE 8033 was also error. Only when the declarant's state of mind is an issue in the case is evidence of his state of mind admissible. In Lucas, they, they asked about uh, the state of mind of the deputy in the case. And in that case, they determined that the state of mind of the deputy um, who was one of the authors in the case was not at issue. Uh, then there's People versus Fisher, 449, Michigan 441. I believe that's a case that the prosecutor uh, relied on. That case also says uh, talks about statements and marital discord in that case was, was the issue. I believe it was a murder, um, husband and wife. And in that case, um, Fisher says, in the case at hand, marital discord, motive, and premeditation are all at issue. Thus, the statements of the victim wife are admissible to show the effect they had on the defendant husband. They were found admissible under a state of mind except, exception to the, to the uh, hearsay rule. I, I'm not going to admit um, people 78 because the defendants, uh, although the defendant's state of mind in this case might be admissible, the shooter's state of mind um, is, is not at issue. We all know this, the shooter's state of mind on uh, November 30th of 2021. Um, additionally, there were um, requests for Facebook messages. I believe those are 160. Or 161 was ruled on, am I correct? Yes, sir. I think it was 118, 153. Was it 133? Oh, I'm sorry, 118, 133, and 153. And 153. All right. So I'm not going to roll on 133 right now. There's, there's something else I want to look into, but I find that um, 118. Uh, the prosecutor notes 801C. I believe that that entire um, chain is hearsay and does not fall under any hearsay ex exception, so I would not be admitting number uh, 118. I'm sorry, Mr. Keyes, did you say 153? Yes, yes, 153. Oh. I, I have 133, but I'm going to pass on that. I'm going to have to look at 153 again. It's the last text in 118 and 153. They're the same text conversation. It's just a different portion of it. It's the last text. It's the text from Jennifer Crumley that says, Ethan, don't do it. Okay. All right. I can get back to you on that, right? You don't need to know before we open. Okay. So with regard to 133 and 153, I will continue my homework assignment. Thank you, Judge. I just want to recap to make sure the record is clear. The court's ruled on exhibits 45, 52, 62 today. Correct. 78 today as well. Correct. Yesterday, 308, 321. Those are two different photographs ruled inadmissible yesterday. We redacted photographs 258, 259, and 260. They were an issue. We gave a copy to the defense counsel this morning. Okay. We agreed to limit Exhibit 80 yesterday, that's the DoorDash text message conversation, to just the okay. 26th to 30th of November. Okay. And um, the rest were ruled to be admissible yesterday. Is that, is that your understanding as well? Yes, Your Honor. And the court's to reserve on 133 and 153. 133 and 153. And you don't you're, you're ruling before openings for those. I do not, Your Honor. And I'm sorry, Mr. Keyes, did you indicate 118 was also not admissible? I should have, yes. Okay. 133 and 153. I also wanted to ask you, there was some discussion yesterday that members of the media have requested a copy of the questionnaire that was provided to the jurors. I don't have a feeling about it either way, but I, if you 
agree to release it. I will if you don't. I won't. So I, I, I don't. I, I really don't have an opinion. Now the jury's a panel. I don't see an issue. Why not? The defense also does not have an opinion on it, Your Honor. All right. So anyone who, anybody who wants one can email the chambers and we'll give it to you. All right. Uh, so, we'll have one more on that. Move your approach, Your Honor. Ready, ready? Can we, I'm sorry, can we have one more? Sure. Just briefly, I'm sorry, related. Yeah. Okay, can you guys turn off the microphone again? some instructions.
I guess I'm going to ask you to remain standing because I'm going to swear you in. All right? Uh, can you all raise your right hand? Members of the jury, you have been chosen to decide a criminal charge made by the state of Michigan against one of your fellow citizens. I'm going to ask you to swear to perform your duty to try the case justly and to reach a true verdict. If your religious beliefs do not permit you to take an oath, you may instead affirm to try the case justly and reach a true verdict. Here is your oath. Do each of you solemnly swear or affirm that in this action now before the court, you will justly decide the question submitted to you, that unless you're discharged by the, by the court and from further deliberation, you will render a true verdict, and that you will render your verdict only on the evidence introduced and in accordance with the instructions of the court. So help you God. Thank you. You may be seated. I, I appreciate you being on time. I do. I have to give you some initial instructions, and then you're going to hear some things today, all right? And you're, don't try to write down what I say, because I speak way too quickly, and because you're going to get a full copy of these instructions when you go to the jury room, all right? I'm going to explain to you some of the legal principles you'll need to follow uh, during the trial. of the charge. Uh, the defendant is charged uh, with four counts of involuntary manslaughter. The prosecutor has alleged two separate theories of defendant's guilt, which may be established under either or both of the two, of the two theories. The first theory of involuntary manslaughter is doing a grossly negligent act causing death. To prove this charge under the first theory, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, in count one, that the defendant caused the death of Madison Baldwin. In count two, the defendant caused the death of Tate Muir. In count three, the defendant caused the death of Hannah St. Juliana. And in count four, the defendant caused the death of Justin Schilling. That is, that Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah St. Juliana and Justin Schilling died as a result of storing a firearm and its ammunition so as to allow access to the firearm and ammunition by his minor child. There may be more than one cause of death. It's not enough that the defendant, uh, defendant's act made it possible for the death to occur. In order to find that the deaths of Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah St. St. Juliana and Justin Schilling were caused by the defendant, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the deaths were the natural or necessary result of the defendant's act. Second, in doing the act that caused Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling's death, the defendant acted in a grossly negligent manner. Gross negligence means more than carelessness. It means willfully disregarding the results to others that might follow from an act or failure to act. In order to find that the defendant was grossly negligent, we must find each of the following three things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant knew of the danger to another. That is, he knew there was a situation that required him to take ordinary care to avoid injuring another. Second, that the defendant could have avoided injuring another by using ordinary care. Third, that the defendant failed to use ordinary care to prevent injuring another when, to a reasonable person, it must have been apparent that the result was likely to be serious injury. As previously noted, the prosecutor has alleged two separate theories of defendant's guilt. The second theory is gross negligence and failing to perform a legal duty. In the second theory, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant had a legal duty to Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling. The legal duty charged here is one imposed by law. In Michigan, a parent has a legal duty to exercise reasonable care to prevent their minor child from intentionally harming others or prevent the minor child from so conducting themselves in a way that creates an unreasonable risk of harm to others if the parent knows that they have the ability to control their minor child and knows of the necessity and opportunity for exercising such control. Second, that the defendant knew of the facts that gave rise to the duty. 
Third, that the defendant willfully neglected or refused to perform that duty, and his failure to perform it was grossly negligent to human life. Fourth, that the death of Madison Baldwin as to count one, Tate Muir as to count two, Hannah St. Juliana as to count three, and Justin Schilling as to count four were directly caused by defendant's failure to perform this duty. That is that Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling died as a result of defendant's failure to exercise reasonable care to control his minor child so as to prevent him from intentionally harming others or from so conducting himself so as to create an unreasonable risk of bodily harm to others, knowing that he has the ability, has the ability to control his child, has the ability to control his child, knowing of the necessity and opportunity to do so. There may be more than one cause of death. It is not enough that the defendant's act made it possible for the death to occur. In order to find that the deaths of Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling were caused by the defendant, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the deaths were the natural or necessary result of the defendant's act or failure to act. With respect to the alternate theories, it's not necessary that you all agree on which theory has been proven, as long as you all agree that the prosecutor has proved at least one of those theories beyond a reasonable doubt. A person accused of a crime is presumed to be innocent. This means that you must start with the presumption that the defendant is innocent. This presumption continues throughout the trial and entitles the defendant to a verdict of not guilty. Unless you're satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that he is guilty, every crime is made up of parts called elements. Um, I, I've just described some of those to you, and you'll hear them over and over again. And they'll also, they'll also be in your jury instructions, uh, the written set that you get at the end. Every crime is made up of parts called elements, and the prosecutor must prove each element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant is not required to prove his innocence or to do anything. If you find that the prosecutor has not proven every element beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant not guilty. A reasonable doubt is a fair, honest doubt growing out of the evidence or lack of evidence. It is not merely an imaginary or possible doubt, but a doubt based on reason and common sense. A reasonable doubt is just that, a doubt that's reasonable after a careful and considered examination of the facts and circumstances of this case. Um, I want to mention uh, that you see cameras in the courtroom. I, I, I don't want you to be concerned about those. Uh, the video cameras and the still cameras will not be taking your picture at any time, so I want to make sure you know that. Uh, a trial follows this procedure. First, the prosecutor makes an opening statement. The prosecutor gives their theories about the case. The defendant's lawyer does not have to make an opening statement, but she may make an opening statement after the prosecutor makes theirs, or she may wait until later. These statements are not evidence. They're only meant to help you understand how each side views the case. Next, the prosecutor presents their evidence. The prosecutor may call witnesses to testify and may show you exhibits like documents or objects. The defendant's lawyer has the right to cross-examine the prosecutor's witnesses. After the prosecutor has pre presented all of their evidence, the defendant's attorney may also offer evidence but does not have to. By law, the defendant does not have to prove his innocence or produce any evidence. If the, defendant, if the defense does call any witnesses, the prosecutor has the right to cross-examine them. The prosecutor may also call witnesses to contradict the testimony of the defense witnesses. After all the evidence has been presented, the prosecutor and the defendant's lawyer will make their closing arguments. Like the opening statements, they are not evidence. They are only meant to help you understand the evidence and the way each side sees the case. You must base your verdict only on the evidence. My responsibilities as the judge in this trial are to make sure that the trial is run fairly and efficiently, to make decisions about evidence, and to instruct you about the law that applies to this case. You must take the law as I give it to you. Nothing I say is, re is meant to reflect my own opinions about the facts of the case. As jurors, you are the ones who will decide this case. Your responsibility as jurors is to decide what the facts of the case are. This is your job and no one else's. You must think about all the evidence and all the testimony and then decide what each piece of evidence means and how important you think it is. This includes how much you believe what each, what each of the witnesses said. What you decide about any fact in this case is final. 
part of your job in deciding what the facts of this case are is to decide, is to decide which witness you believe and how important you think their testimony is. You do not have to accept or reject everything a witness says. You're free to believe all, none, or part of any person's testimony. In deciding which testimony you believe, you should rely on your own common sense and everyday experience. However, in deciding whether you believe a person's testimony, you must set aside any bias or prejudice you may have based on the witness's disability, race, national origin or ethnicity, gender, gender identity or sexual orientation, or religion, age, or socioeconomic status. There's no fixed set of rules for judging whether you believe a witness, but it may help you to think about these questions. Was the witness able to see or hear clearly? How long was the witness watching or listening? Was anything else going on that might have distracted the witness? Does the witness seem to have a good memory? How does the witness look and act while testifying? Does the witness seem to be making an honest effort to tell the truth? Or does the witness seem to evade the questions or argue with the lawyers? Does the witness's age or maturity affect how you judge his or her testimony? Does the witness have any bias or prejudice or any personal interest in how this case is decided? Have there been any promises, threats, suggestions, or other influences that affect how the witness testifies? In general, does the witness have any special reason to tell the truth or any special reason to lie? All in all, how reasonable does the witness's testimony seem when you think about all of the other evidence in the case? When it's time for you to decide the case, you're only allowed to consider the evidence that was admitted in this case. Evidence includes only the sworn testimony of witnesses, the exhibits admitted into evidence, and anything else I tell you to consider as evidence. The questions the lawyers ask the witnesses are not evidence. Only the answers are evidence. You should not think that something is true just because one of the lawyers asks questions that assume or suggest that it is. I may ask some of the witnesses questions myself. I, sometimes I assume if I'm confused about something, someone else on the jury might be. These questions are not meant to reflect my opinion about the evidence. If I ask questions, my only reason would be to ask about things that may not have been fully explored. If you can't hear something that is said or presented, or if you cannot see a witness or evidence, please raise your hand immediately. During the trial, the lawyers may object to certain questions or statements made by the other lawyers or witnesses. I'll rule on these objections according to the law. My rulings for or against one side or the other are not meant to reflect my opinion about the case of the case. The lawyers and I will definitely have discussions out of your hearing. Also, while you're in the jury room, I may have to take care of other matters that have nothing to do with this case. Pay no attention to these interruptions. You must not discuss the case with anyone, including your family or friends. You must not even discuss it with the other jurors until the time comes for you to decide the case. When it's time for you to decide the case, I'll send you to the jury room for that purpose. Then you should discuss the case amongst yourselves, but only in the jury room and only when all the jurors are here. You must not talk to the defendant, the lawyers, the witnesses, or anyone who may be connected to this case. This means that you may not speak to these individuals, even if it has nothing to do with this case. You should be very cautious about speaking to people because you may inadvertently speak to someone connected to this case. This restriction is necessary to avoid even the appearance of any improper conduct on any person's part. If anyone tries to discuss the case with you or in your presence, tell them to stop. Explain that you're a juror and that you're not allowed to discuss the case. If they continue, leave. Report the incident to court staff as soon as you return to court. When the trial is over, these restrictions no longer apply. When the trial is over, you may, if you wish, discuss the case with anyone. I mentioned before that it's hopeful, it's helpful, I guess I'm hopeful and it's helpful, that you wear your badge because that sort of alerts people in the courthouse that they shouldn't be chatting you up, okay? All right. During the trial, do not read, listen to, or watch any news reports about the case. Under the law, the evidence you must consider to decide the case must meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth. The lawyers must be able to cross-examine them. Because news reports do not have to meet these standards, they could give you incorrect or misleading information that might unfairly favor one side. So to be fair to both sides, you must follow those instructions. 
The restrictions I'm about to describe are meant to ensure that the parties get a fair trial. In our judicial system, it's crucial that jurors are not influenced by anything or anyone outside the courtroom. Under the law, the evidence you must uh, consider has to meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth, and the lawyers must be able to cross-examine them. Because information obtained outside the courtroom does not have these safeguards, it could give you incorrect or misleading information that might unfairly favor one side. These restrictions start now, well, really yesterday, and continue until I discharge you from jury service. It's your duty as a juror to decide this case based solely on the evidence that you see and hear in the courtroom. You must not consider information that comes from anywhere else. This means that until you deliver your verdict, you must not read, watch, listen to, or receive any information, including opinions or commentary about the case, whether in newspapers, on television, the radio, the internet, or on social media platforms. You also must not research any aspect of the case during the trial. This means research using a cellular phone, computer, or other electronic device to search the internet, as well as research with traditional sources like dictionaries, reference manuals, newspapers, or magazines. You must not investigate the case on your own or conduct any experiments concerning the case, including investigation or experiments using the internet, cell cellular phones, computers, or other electronic devices. You must not visit the scene of any event in this trial. If it's necessary for you to view or visit the scene, court staff will take you there as a group under court supervision. You must not consider as evidence any personal knowledge you have of the scene. You must not share any information about the case by any means, including cellular phones or social media. This means that even if you're not discussing the case with someone else, you may not post any information about the case on social media websites or in any other manner. If you discover that a fellow juror has violated my instructions, please report it to my court staff. You may take notes during the trial if you wish, but of course you don't have to. If you do take notes, you should be careful that it does not distract you from paying attention to all the evidence. When you go to the jury room to decide your verdict, you may use your notes to help you remember what happened in the courtroom. If you take notes, do not let anyone except the other jurors see them during deliberations. You must give them to my clerk when you leave each evening your notes will not be examined by anyone, and when your jur jury service concludes, your notes will be collected and destroyed. Um, it is possible to replay a witness's testimony upon your request. I think I mentioned this to you yesterday. However, you would be required to hear the entire witness's testimony. You can't fast forward to a certain part and all yell, aha, okay? It's not fair to both sides. You would have to hear that entire witness, all right? There's more than one defendant involved in this matter. You should consider only the evidence presented in this defendant's trial. Each is entitled to have his or her case decided on the evidence and the law that applies to him or her. You can see that there are 15 of you. Um, we have you in two different jury rooms just for uh, comfort. After you've heard all the evidence in my instructions, we will draw lots to decide which of you will be dismissed to form a jury of 12. Possible penalty should not influence your decision. If you find the defendant guilty, it is my duty to fix the penalty within the limits provided by law. I'll definitely be giving you more instructions throughout the trial. After all the evidence has been presented, you will hear the lawyer's closing arguments. Following the closing arguments, I'll give you additional instructions about the rules of law to apply to this case. You should consider all of my instructions as a connected series. Taken all together, they are the law you must follow. After my final instructions, you'll go to the jury room to decide on your verdict. A verdict must be unanimous. That means that every juror must agree on it, and it must reflect the individual decision of each juror. It's important for you to maintain an open mind and not make a decision about anything in the case until you go to the jury room to decide the case. You must not let bias, prejudice, or public opinion influence your decision. Each of us may have biases or perceptions about other people based on stereotypes. We may be aware of some of our biases, though we do not express them. We not, may not be fully aware of some of our other biases. Take the time you need to test what might be automatic or instinctive judgments and to reflect carefully about the evidence. I caution you again to avoid reaching conclusions that may have been unintentionally influenced by stereotypes. You must reach your own conclusions about this case individually. 
but you should do so only after listening to and considering the opinions of the other jurors who may have different backgrounds and perspectives from yours. All right, so we're going to hear um, openings. Possibly. Thank you. <coughs> November the 30th, 2021, James Crumbly's 15-year-old son walked out of the boys' bathroom in Oxford High School holding a 9mm handgun. James Crumbly's son walked out, he pointed, he aimed that 9mm and fired it 32 times over the course of the next 9 minutes. He fired that weapon <coughs> at teachers and students. He killed four, wounded seven, and terrorized the entire community. James Crumbly bought that gun that his son used to kill as a gift for his son four days before the attack. James Crumbly failed to secure that gun in a way to prevent his son from accessing it. Anna was 14 years old. Madison Baldwin, she was 17. Tate Muir, he was 16. Justin Schilling, 17 years old. These are the four students who never made it home that day. What happened inside that school was truly a nightmare come to life. But it didn't have to. That nightmare was preventable. There are three people in this world who are criminally responsible for the deaths of Hannah, Madison, Tate, and Justin. The shooter who committed murder, no doubt, he's responsible. But so are his parents. But not for murder. They're responsible for their gross negligence, for involuntary manslaughter. Because that nightmare was preventable and it was foreseeable. The shooter's case is done. The shooter's mother, Jennifer Crumbly, her case is done. You're here to decide the level of gross negligence of James Crumbly. And you will learn throughout this trial that he was the adult out of anyone in the world in the best position to prevent these kids' deaths. You're going to learn that those kids would still be alive today had James Crumbly seized any one of the tragically small and easy opportunities given to him to prevent his son from committing murder. Any one of them. These were opportunities that were literally given to him, yet he disregarded. During this trial, you're going to hear about events from the spring of 2021 through December of 2021. November of 21 is the critical time period especially November the 30th. But that earlier evidence is going to give you some context into the family life in the Crumbly household. It's going to give you some context to learn that the shooting didn't just happen out of the blue. The shooter didn't snap. What happened was foreseeable, especially to his father. I'm going to talk to you about some of the evidence that you're going to see through this trial. And we'll start with this. This is a six-hour, nine-millimeter handgun. This was a firearm purchased by James Crumbly as a gift for his son on November the 26th, 2021. This is a picture taken by the shooter, found on his phone, the day that gun was brought home. This is a Instagram post from the defendant's son. The next day, November the 27th, 2021. That's after his mom took their son to the shooting range to practice with that gun. Took my new SIG out to the range today. Definitely need to get used to the new sights, LOL. This is a post from Jennifer Crumbly, the shooter's mother, the defendant's wife, that same day, November the 27th of 2021. Mom and son day testing out his new Christmas present. My first time shooting a 9mm, I hit the bullseye. You're going to learn that 
it wasn't just those two extra magazines for the handgun in the plastic case that came with it when James Crumlin made that purchase. You see, he was given the tools to make that firearm safe. He was provided a cable lock. It was provided by the manufacturer, by Stig Sauer, and went to the firearm dealer who sold it to James Crumlin. It was for that gun. This is what it looked like the day the gun was purchased, November the 26th, 2021. This is what it looks like now. Still in its original packaging, still with both keys in the lock. It was never used. The decision that James Crumbly made to buy that gun as a gift for his son was made even though he knew that his son was in the midst of total and complete social isolation and had been in a downward spiral of distress that had been going on for some time. You'll see evidence that as early as spring of 2021, the shooter had expressed to his one and only friend that he had asked his father for help. He told him to suck it up. That was in April of 2021. You'll learn that instead of receiving help or intervention of any kind, James Crumbly instead began to take his son to the shooting range, even buying himself a 22 caliber Caltech semi-automatic pistol and his son a different gun, 22 caliber two-shot Derringer. That was June of 2021. They would go to the range together on a consistent basis over the next few months. We have evidence of a number of trips, and you'll see some of that. Some of this background is going to shed light on what happened in November of 2021. This is a pivotal month in the Crumbly home. As I said, the shooter had one and only one friend. That was no secret. James knew about that. You're going to see evidence that the shooter and his friend would communicate with each other throughout the day and throughout the night. The level of data on that text message conversation alone dwarfs everything else on the shooter's phone. You'll hear evidence that there were over 22,000 text messages in just one year between the shooter and his friend. Those two shared quite a bit with each other. This is the friend that the shooter confided in when he asked his father for help. That friend was taken from the shooter at the end of October of 21. He didn't just move schools and go to another town. He was taken out of state without warning, without notice, and without a way to communicate. The impact on the defendant's son was severe. His entire social connection was severed, and James was there to know about it. You see, he wasn't working at that time. From November the 1st to November 9th, he didn't have a job. And when he did work before that, it was from home. When he did get a job on November the 10th, it was for DoorDash, where he could set his own schedule and decide when he did work and when he didn't work. It was also during this month of November that the defendant's son began to write in a journal. Some of that is going to be permitted to be shown to you, and Judge Matthews decides what you see and what you don't see. The portion you'll see is that the defendant's son wrote about how he was begging his parents for help, how he's begging for a more powerful 9mm handgun to commit the school shooting, and how he's able to obtain access to the murder weapon. Again, this evidence is important for you as background to what happened on November the 30th, but it also gives you a glimpse into the level of knowledge possessed by James Crumbly when he made the decision to buy that six sour 9mm handgun for his son on November the 26th, and then, just as importantly, what he decided not to do the morning of the shooting. You see, James Crumbly was afforded what might have been the easiest and most glaring opportunity to prevent the shooting a full three and a half hours on November 30th before the first shot was ever fired. Because he was shown this. This is a math worksheet. These are drawings and writings from the defendant's son. November 30th, 2021. One of his teachers saw him doing this, took a picture of that, and sent it to the shooter's counselor. 
The counselor came down and took the shooter out of class, brought him to his office to find out what was going on. You will learn it took that counselor all of 20 minutes to decide that immediate parental intervention was required. He made that decision even though he had about a fraction of the knowledge possessed by James Crumley. You see, this shooter, this drawing, as well as an altered version created by the shooter, were both sent from that counselor to Jennifer Crumley, who shared it immediately with James Crumley before they arrived at the school. The severity of the situation wasn't lost on James or Jennifer Crumley either. They expressed their concern about what they see here, the words, help me, blood everywhere, a picture drawing of a gun, of a, a person with two bullet holes in blood. They expressed their concern about that drawing to themselves in Facebook messages. This is Jennifer Crumley, she's in blue. Call now, all caps, emergency. This is November the 30th, 2021 at 9.33 in the morning. Followed simply with emergency. Then she sends her husband James, the defendant, both the original drawing as well as the altered version of it that the shooter created. That's at 9.38 in the morning. James Crumley's response, my God, WTF. And then, he says what he was actually doing that morning, vet not here, it's McElmurray's for Curious Works, still waiting on the vet. You see, James and Jennifer Crumley spent quite a bit of time away from the home, attending to their horses. That's what he was doing the morning of the shooting. Jennifer Crumley, he said he was distraught about last night. James, we talked about it this morning. You talk to him? Jennifer, can you call? Then heading to his school, I'm very concerned. That was at 10.04 in the morning. Unfortunately for everyone, they kept that private concern to themselves. They didn't share it with the school counselor. Despite what they knew, despite what they thought, James Crumbly and his wife, neither one of them, mentioned anything about the gun being purchased for him four days before the shooting. James Crumbly didn't say a word about how that picture of the gun that his son drew looked identical, that you will see, of the 6 hour 9 millimeter. They didn't say anything about the prior request for help. James Crumbly didn't mention anything about the severity, the real circumstances of the shooter's friend being taken from him. They didn't just fail to inform in that meeting, though. They also failed to act. It was recommended at that meeting that James and Jennifer Crumbly get help for their son then, immediately, that day. And they were provided with a list of resources with mental health providers that would fit any budget, any insurance plan, or even no insurance at all. But they didn't. James Crumbly didn't do anything. Jennifer Crumbly didn't do anything. Neither one of them called. They didn't take him home. The reason given to the counselors is that they had to work. But James didn't mention that as a DoorDash driver, he set his own schedule. He didn't mention that he hadn't even signed in for the day for DoorDash yet. He was at the vet. Or that as a DoorDash driver, he was able to just put his son next to him in the car. It was one, again, one of the most glaringly missed opportunities. But instead of seizing that incredible opportunity that was before him, James Crumley spent the next two hours driving around town making deliveries, never once bothering to stop by his house, which was just a mile away, to check on the whereabouts of the gun that his son drew, even when he drove by the house to do so. Never once. The gun that he knew was kept on security. That is until after the Oxford School District sent out an email blast to all district parents of an active shooter situation. You'll learn that that email reached James Crumley at about 1.10 p.m. And by pure happenstance, James Crumley was at the exact location that parents of Oxford High School students were told to go in case of emergencies. Their reunification point is the mire on Ray Road next to the high school, directly adjacent to it. By pure coincidence, he happened to be at the exact location where hundreds of people were scrambling to get to but he didn't stay. That's when he went home. That's when he went home to look for the gun. And that's because he knew. 
you will hear that there was one and only one person who called the police that day to identify their kid as a suspected shooter. It was James Tremblay. This nightmare, these murders, were preventable by him, foreseeable by him. During this trial, you're going to hear from between 15 and 20 witnesses. I do need to tell you that you won't hear from the shooter. Neither side is entitled to call him to the stand. You won't hear from Jennifer Crumbly. Again, neither side is entitled to call her to the stand. But you will hear a lot about what happened in the days, the weeks, the months before the shooting, specifically November the 26th and November the 30th. Again, those are the critical days. What happened from the 30th, from the time of the meeting to the time the first shot was fired. You're going to learn that throughout the investigation, investigators obtained information from social media accounts, from cell phone forensic analysis. They obtained banking records. They obtained GPS pings. So you're going to be able to put together a bit of a digital footprint of the Crumbly life. And you're also going to learn what James and Jennifer Crumbly did after the shooting. Evidence we be presented to you to show that the defendant and his wife withdrew as much cash as they could and they tried to liquidate their assets. They were found hiding from the police in the city of Detroit in an art studio on December the 4th, 2021. That's after they were charged with these crimes. Which you will never hear, and I want to make sure this is clear, you will never hear any allegation that James Crumley knew what his son was going to do on November the 5th. That he bought the gun knowing what his son was going to do. If he bought a gun knowing his son was going to commit mass murder, then he'd be charged with murder. There is no claim that James Crumley gave his son that firearm hoping he would murder four students. So then the question becomes, how is it that a father can be held responsible for the intentional acts of a teenage son? And the answer to that question is twofold. It's two reasons. First, it's important to remember that James Crumbly is not charged with murder. He's charged with involuntary manslaughter. Murder, or eating a, a betting murder, is an intentional crime. Involuntary manslaughter is rooted in negligence. It is by definition, causation, an unintentional killing. <clears throat> Second, it's because it takes a rare and specific set of circumstances to rise to the level of voluntary manslaughter when there are multiple causes of death. A rare set of circumstances. Those rare circumstances you will find present in this case. It takes gross negligence. It takes causation of death. And it takes that other person's acts to be reasonably foreseeable. Those are the three elements that must be proved. And that's what Judge Matthews is going to tell you. You will learn that the law says that in this situation, there are actually two different ways to find this defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter. You are able to pick either because the law, the law allows you to do so. Involuntary manslaughter is committed when someone's actions or inactions are grossly negligent or their failure to perform their legal duty as a parent was grossly negligent. That gross negligence caused death. And not the cause. It was a cause of death. And that's important. Because the judge is going to tell you that there may be more than one cause of death. Such as this situation. As long as that other cause was reasonably foreseeable to him, to the defendant. Not to everyone else in the world, but to him. The father who bought the gun, the father who raised the shooter, the father who knew what was going on in his life, the father who suspected him as a school shooter, well before his name was made public, well before anyone from the police department told him it was his son. The law allows multiple people to be held responsible in this case. And that's going to come to you from Judge Matthews. Gross negligence is the failure to use ordinary care to avoid a known danger, even though it was apparent to a reasonable person 
that serious injury would result. It's the willful disregard of danger. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we were here. James Crumbly's willful disregard of danger and his failure to use just ordinary care, just ordinary care, when he was the one who knew the background, he was the one that knew the origins of this drawing. Him sitting in that counselor's office, looking at this drawing, and then not only staying silent, but then his failure to act, right there, is his willful disregard of danger. Right there. You're going to hear a lot of evidence and arguments in this case. It's important that we all understand that you're not here to talk about, to decide on parenting. This case isn't about parenting. It's not illegal to be a bad parent. It's not kids doing kids things. We're here to talk about a preventable mass murder. No one will ever suggest to you that every parent can or should be held responsible for everything their teenager does. That's not the law. No one will ever suggest that to you. But in a situation where the father was in a position to reasonably foresee what the son was going to do, because the father armed him four days before and was shown a clear statement of intent of what the son was going to do, that is when that rare set of circumstances is present in these specific set of facts. James Crumbly is in charge with what his son did on November 30th. James Crumbly is charged with what he did and what he didn't do on November 30th. That is a very important distinction. That is what the law allows. That is what we are asking you to do. This case is not about guns. It's not about even how all guns should be stored in the home. It's not about gun laws. This case is about this gun for this kid with these issues. Not secure when shown this picture. That's what this case is about. When this kid was begging for a more deadly weapon. That's why we're here. I ask that you listen to the testimony, you review the evidence, and you follow the law. If you do that, you will undoubtedly reach a fair and just verdict. If you do that, you will find that James Crumbly was one of the three people in this world criminally responsible for what happened on November the 30th, 2021. And you will find him guilty as charged. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keyes. Ms. Lillian, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Go ahead. The events of November 30th of 2021 undeniably changed people's lives in ways that most people could never imagine. Four children lost their lives. Families were destroyed. And a community was terrorized. But this case is not about what happened inside of Oxford High School. This case is about what happened outside of Oxford High School. The prosecution alleges that James Crumbly was aware that his son was a danger to others and that he failed to protect other people from his son. The prosecution alleges that James Crumbly had knowledge that his son could and would hurt other people and that he failed to protect those people, that he failed to take steps to protect others. And ladies and gentlemen, that simply is not true. You will hear evidence in this case of what occurred inside of Oxford High School. You will hear the prosecution's version of what they claim James Crumbly may have known. You will hear that a gun was purchased on November 26th of 2021 by James Crumbly. You will hear what kind of a gun it was. It was a handgun. You will hear how it was stored. You may hear where it was stored. You will hear whether or not Mr. Crumbly's son knew where that firearm was. 
Pay attention also to what you don't hear. Pay attention to that you won't hear that James Crumbly knew that his son knew where that firearm was. Ladies and gentlemen, James Crumbly was not aware that his son had access to that firearm. You will hear testimony that access was not allowed in James Crumbly's mind. Ladies and gentlemen, you will not hear that James Crumbly knew what his son was going to do. You will not hear that James Crumbly even suspected that his son was a danger. That math homework that the prosecution is putting up on the screen, you're going to hear about that. You're going to hear about what other people thought about that. People at the school, including James Crumbly. There's going to be probably quite a bit of discussion about that piece of math homework, ladies and gentlemen, and you're going to hear all about it. Ladies and gentlemen, James Crumbly did not know what his son was going to do. He did not know that his son could potentially harm other people. He did not know what his son was planning. He did not purchase that gun with the knowledge that his son may use it against other people. You will not hear that he did that. The prosecution told you that. The prosecution just told you you're not going to hear that. You're not going to hear that James Crumbly purchased that gun with the knowledge that his son was going to go harm other people. But what the prosecution wants you to believe, the part that's not true, is that James Crumbly knew what his son was going to do and knew that he had a duty to protect other people from his son. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not true. He didn't know. You're going to hear about James Crumbly's relationship with his son. There may be other witnesses who testify about that, about how James interacted with his son, including on the day when that math homework was, was shown. You're going to hear from other people. They're going to tell you, in their own words, what they observed about James Crumbly and his son, about what they observed about his son, about any concerns they may have had. Other people, not just James Crumbly, but other people. Other people with additional education, additional training to evaluate situations like this and evaluate individuals. You're going to hear from those people probably. And they're going to tell you in their own words what they thought about the math homework, about Mr. Crumbly's son, about Mr. Crumbly's interactions with his son. Yes, James Crumbly was a DoorDash driver. We all know that. It's been said multiple times. Ladies and gentlemen, being a DoorDash driver doesn't mean that your job is any less important to you or other people than any other job. It doesn't mean that you don't feel that you have a duty to go to work. And ladies and gentlemen, when you're not aware of an immediate, imminent danger, why would you do anything different than what you normally do? You wouldn't. Because you don't have any reason to think you need to. So ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear the evidence. You've heard a lot of questions in the last couple of days from both the prosecution and myself. You probably have an idea where each side lands on these issues. But you're going to hear the evidence. You're going to hear from people other than us. And you're going to be able to hear in their words what they thought about those days from November 26th to November 30th of 2021. And their feelings, what they observed, any concerns that they may or may not have had. The prosecution has asked you repeatedly to follow the law. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. Please do follow the law. And I'm confident, we are confident, that if you do that, if you follow the law, that you will find James Crumbly not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Should we give them a little break? We have a little break. I'm going to give you a little break so you might have to do a little bit of setup in the courtroom and then you're going to hear the first one. Okay. So, for, so, for, so for about 10 minutes, about five minutes. All rise for the jury. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
breaking down, right, Judge? Yeah, yeah. I'm just okay. trying to get rid of some paper. Uh, they'll probably like move it. Yeah. Okay. Like around, turn it around. No, my mic came in and they moved it. I was like, uh oh, it's kind of behind them. Just, <laughs> I, I actually, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I can't give you an answer. Kind of a crash. Yeah. <laughs>
Your Honor, calling people versus James Crumbly, case number 222799-989-FH. Thank you. Good morning. Mark Hughes on behalf of the people. Karen McDonald on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Maria Lehman on behalf of James Crumbly, who is standing to my left. I'm ready for the judge. We are, Your Honor. Yes, testimony about to give is a true psychopath. Mm -hmm. uh, could you step up and have a seat? <laughs> and would you state your name for the record and spell your first and last name? Molly Darnell, M-O-L-L-Y, D-A-R-N-E-L-L. Okay. May I proceed? Yeah. Good morning. Can I call you Molly? You can. Okay. Um, and Molly, I know you testified a couple times, um, so you know, keep your voice up. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want me to slow down or you don't understand the question, just let me know. Okay. Okay. Can you tell the jury what you do for a living? I'm an educator. Okay. And where are you employed? I'm employed at Oxford Community Schools. I've been there since the fall of 98. So uh, that would be your whole teaching career? That's correct. Okay. Um, what is your role now? My role now is I am a virtual teacher with Oxford Virtual Academy. I'm a mentor teacher for middle schoolers. All right, so uh, you, do you go to the high school now? I do not, no. All right. Can you tell the jury what your role was um, and which building you worked at on November 30th of 2021? Um, on November of 2021, I was the International Baccalaureate Coordinator for the Middle Years Program, which was a 610 program as well as the English language arts um, coach, which was a 612 position. Okay, so you didn't have, um, did you work with, did you have contact, instructional contact with students or was it more teachers? No, I worked with teachers, um, predominantly the English language arts department, but I worked with many other teachers throughout the, um, throughout the 612 uh, curriculum. It was like, a, it's a coaching job. So instructional curriculum, that type of what, like what's happening in the classroom. Um, at that point in time. What was, when was the last time you had a traditional uh, teaching schedule? Um, a traditional teaching schedule, um, might have been 2015, 
Um, I'd have to really go back and look at my resume to know that. Okay. Um, but in the fall of 2020, I did have a classroom. We went back face to face, and so we pulled all of our instructional coaches out to teach a few hours of the day so that we could spread students throughout the building and get students back um, instructionally. Okay, so after COVID, uh, the coaching uh, uh, faculty we moved started, back into started to take more teaching assignments so that you can spread kids out. Is Correct. That, do I have it right? Correct. Okay. Um, on, on November of 20, in November of 2021, were there kids in the school that you knew? And if so, how, how did you have contact with them? Um, there were kids that I knew from the class that I had had the previous year. There might have been, you know, um, having been in the district for a long time, there were a lot of teachers who had children that were in that building. So I knew a lot of them, too. Okay. Um, I'm glad you, you brought that up. Uh, does Oxford have a lot of faculty who send their children to the, the district? Yeah, I would say... Uh, Many of our faculty send their students through Oxford schools, yes. Okay. And um, the kids that you knew in that building that day, did you also know them from middle school with this, or you just knew them? Yeah, um, just knew them from knowing their parents, um, and uh, or if I had them in class the year before. But there might have been a kid in passing that I met here or there, um, but for the most part on that year I had no contact with students other than... Um, you know, if like a kid wanted to stop in and see me, or if we met in the hallway, or okay. But you did you have a traditional classroom? On, um, I did not. I shared an office. Um, it was like a half classroom. So it was, was in. A, was it, the classroom turned into two offices, or an correct? Office? It was a classroom turned into two offices. It was in the instru one of the instructional halls, the math science instructional hall, um, and I shared it with two other coaches in the district. Okay. You're the first witness, <clears throat> so the jury is not seeing a map of the school. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put that up in a minute. Okay. It's not. It's already been admitted. There's no objection to that. Um, <clears throat> but before I do, can you just generally describe how the school is laid out? It's a fairly new building, correct? It is fairly new. Um, the building, the main part of the building, was opened, I think, in the fall of '98, the year that I started um, with Oxford Schools, and then I think it was the fall of '04. Um, that we started, that it became the high school. Um, so it's, it's a fairly new building. Um, there is like uh, one main hallway that kind of runs up the center and it hugs into the courtyard. Um, it almost reminds me like if you opened it in a map, you would see it almost mirrors itself in many ways, especially the area that I was in. Okay, and your hallway, was, was were the hallways organized by subject matter? Yes, we had like our foreign language hallway, our English language arts hallway, we had our math section, um, social studies, and then science wrapped around the side. Our electives were on the outskirts of the high school. And how did the students and the faculty refer to um, uh, uh, bathrooms and exits? How did they describe them from one to, from one to the other? Um, it might have been like the staff, the exit by the staff parking lot. Um, that's how I knew them. Okay. I know that there are numbers on all the doors. Um, numbers are not my thing. <laughs> your English. Uh, what? Um, where is this? Is there? Is there a senior? Uh, there is a leisure senior, area yes. at Oxford. Yeah. So right up that main corridor, um, which is like if, I said, if you folded it, there's like this one main hallway. Right um, in the center of the building is considered the senior window, um, okay. and that is right in front of our courtyard, one of our courtyards. And. The hallways, the subject matter, did you typically find upperclassmen, lowerclassmen, or it was all mixed in all throughout the building? Um, well, many of the seniors did hang out in that area, or kids throughout the building. There was no, um, there was no area specific for like freshmen. So okay. All right. I'm going to um, show you now and the jury what's been admitted and marked as uh, People's Exhibit 9. Can I have this? Yes, it should. You just take a second. That goes on the last. It'll take a second. Okay. Thank you. Can you tell the jury what we're looking at? Uh, this is a map of the high school. and uh, So you see where that it says media center in the middle and then court right below it. 
when we were talking about that senior window. Right there. Correct. So that senior window is just south of court. Like that's the senior window, that window that is on the south end of court. No, go back. Yeah, right on like the south end of court. Sorry, south. Okay. Am I saying, am I, maybe I'm directionally challenged. I, I think, I think I'm sorry, I am. I'm going to want to go north. Okay, so what, um, I guess it would be east. what was the number for your classroom? Uh, my number is 222. Two, two. Okay, and we'll, right there? Correct. Okay. And then what's in the middle area right there to? Actually, sorry, I'm not 222, two, two, I'm 224. Two, okay. I was right next door to 222. Two, two. Do you see 224? Two, two, uh, you can't see the number, but you can see between 226 and 222. 222. Yeah, okay. there's a bunch of names written in that. That was all the coaches, myself right. and the other and coaches. To the left of that, what is that area? Um, the other room on the other side. That, that little, yeah, that. What is this area? What's in there? Um, that area on, this, on the lower end is... Um, the science labs. Um, on the on the upper end, there is a I can see a bathroom to the right, a student bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and the senior area is up. It's up. In the middle. Yeah, it's right there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I want to draw your attention. Um, to around 12.50 on November 30th, 2021. Do you remember that day? I do. Okay. Um, do you, did you have uh, any kind of teaching assignment on that day? I did not have a teaching assignment on that day. Um, it was a Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Okay. Can, um, you, can you tell the jury um, about the Oxford uh, lunchtime schedule because it's a little it's a little um, confusing we run a seven tier period rotating schedule which means that kids meet for six class periods a day um, the lunches have a split hour so they have an a b and a c lunch um, if they're a lunch they go to their class the second half if they're a b lunch they go to class have lunch go back to class and if there's a c lunch they go to class then they go to, to lunch okay and um about how many minutes is passing time, generally? Um, I want to say it was eight minutes. Um, and what did you typically do during passing time? Um, during passing time, I might have gone out in the hall and chatted with a colleague or two, checked in on something. Um, that is also a time for, it's like the time that teachers need to get things done. Um, so there might be a quick interaction. I might you know, see a kid in the hallway passing by. Um, but Pretty often, um, like it was just standing guard outside my room or standing outside my room. Okay. Um, at around um, 12.50 that day, mm -hmm. do you remember what you were doing? Uh, yeah, a, a student that I had in the fall of 2020 wanted to chat. And so she came in and, um, and we chatted for a few minutes uh, and, and, then, and then she left. Do your, um, as a general rule, do you keep your door open or closed? Open. All right. And your classroom, um, as we see in the map, was smaller. Mm -hmm. um, what, it, what was the layout of the classroom? Were there, were there traditional student desks in there? Or can you explain to the jury what, yeah. what the classroom was like? Um, if you walked in s straight ahead, you would have seen my desk. Um, to the left of that, you would have seen my, one of my colleagues' desks. And then just on the the wall like, closest to the hallway, there was another um, coach's desk. What is at the back of the classroom when you go in the front, the, the wall you're facing, what, what is that? There's a, a large window that leads out to the courtyard. Okay. Um, once the student left, what did you do? Um, there was a few minutes left during passing, and so I walked around to my desk and opened up my um, Laptop. All right, and we're, we're, we're going to check it. some emails. Yeah. Okay, and are you facing the door or? I'm facing you... the door. Okay. Correct. All right, and what happened next, Mel? 
Um, I'm sitting on my laptop, uh, reading through an email. The door's open, and I notice a group of kids uh, uh, running by. It was um, a movement that I had never really seen before. Um, they were moving, like there was a, a hyperness to the, the voices, um, and it was almost like they were pushing forward, like trying to move as fast as possible. Um, and that seemed unusual to you? That was very unusual to me, yes. Okay, why was it unusual? Um, I, have, I have never seen a group of students move like that before. Um, my, because of their speed or the way that they're... I think it was all of it. Um, there was a speed to it, the tone of voice. There wasn't any, like... Um, you know, my first instinct was that it was a fight, but a fight, because it was the only thing that, you know, was the closest to what um, students would be moving quickly or swiftly to, um, especially in that large group of kids. Um, did you stay seated or did you get up? Um, I got up. I exited the classroom or the office and moved about... Um, in the hallway? Into the hallway. I moved into the hallway to see, like, well, what's going on? Okay, if you look at the map, which direction did you turn? Did you turn towards I door turned four? I towards door you... four. Okay. Um, so I turned towards door four. What, what did you see in the hallway? Um, I see, so the hallway kind of bends. So I, have, I come out of my, of my office, and I'm closer to that 221, but not fully there, right? I'm like closer, I'm closer to 221, and I'm looking, and I can see all these kids rushing out of door four, um, which didn't make sense to me because, again, I had never seen this happen. Um, so, uh, that's what you saw. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you hear anything at that point? It was silent. Um, there was a, there was no noise. Was that unusual? Absolutely unusual. Okay. And at what, that time, yes, absolutely. And what did you do next? Um, I, went, I moved back into my classroom, trying to understand what's happening. Um, and I walk back into the classroom and I'm thinking, okay, um, could there be a prank? I doubt there would be, you know, and, and so it's probably 10 seconds, if 10 seconds. Um, and I hear three things really close together. Okay. What, what did those three things sound like? Um, one was an announcement. The bells chiming in an announcement of um, our principal coming over the PA and saying, um, we're headed into lot we're going moving into lockdown. This is not a drill. Okay. And you, as a, as a, a faculty member for this many years, what is lockdown? What have you been trained um, to, um, to know about that? What does that mean? So we're trained in the ALICE protocol, um, which means we have to use our senses to figure out what's happening. Um, but with all of those students and with what I was hearing, the two additional things that I was hearing was like a loud pop, 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 and then multiple doors slamming, um, I moved to shut my door okay. um, and, and lock myself in. I want to stop for a minute. Mm -hmm. What is your experience with firearms up until this point? Up until this point, um, my experience with firearms is limited. Um, I have, however, shot a weapon. In, you know, I have in my life shot a weapon. Okay. Um, have you been to a range before? Do you, is this a, a hobby that you have? It is not a hobby. I have been to a range. Okay. Um, when you heard the pop, 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 what did you think? Um, I, I thought in my head I could have mistaken them for lockers slamming easily. Um, I, they did not sound like gunshots to me, but I'm not really... You know, I've been to a range once. I've not, um, 
I don't really, I don't really know what a gun sounds like. <clears throat> okay, so what, what you said the three things, the announcement? The announcement, the pop, pop, pop of a <laughs> weapon um, that I now know, and, um, and doors slamming. Okay, and what did you do? Um, I moved to shut my classroom door because when I had come back in, I had not shut it. So I shut that classroom door, and we have um, a night lock next to all the doors. Can you tell the jury what a night lock is? Um, a night lock is a device that slides into the door. Where do you slide it? You slide it in the bottom of the door, um, and it keeps the door. So on my office and all of the rooms in the building have glass partitions on the side. So if someone were to shoot out that and try to get in, um, it would keep that door from being opened. Okay, I'm going to show you what's been admitted as Exhibit 10. Mm -hmm. Molly, what is that? Uh, that's the office that I had. Okay, so that's your door open? Yep. All right. And um, where is your... This is not a picture... Is this a picture that ad adequately reflects the normal um, Lit, no. late? No. Okay. This um, was... Uh, we're going to yeah. get to what's, yeah. why that's like that, but where is the desk that you were sitting at? Straight ahead, um, there's that tall lamp. My desk was the other way. The other way. Yeah, right there. Okay. So uh, you approach, you said you approached the door, you shut it? I did. I shut it. And then um, where was the night lock? It is in this photograph. Um, you can see that bag that's mounted to the wall. It was, yep, that's a, a blood bag that we keep in all the classrooms. Um, and then, or like a medical bag or whatever. And then just in front of that, you can't even see it. It's so close to the door. Okay. Was the night lock. Okay. Um, and I think I might have interrupted you. What is significant about the night lock and why is it used in, an act, in a uh, lockdown? Um, it's a measure, it's an additional measure of barricading yourself into a room if need be. Can you open the door with a, if the night lock is installed? You cannot. Um, what about if you had a key to the door? It wouldn't matter. You cannot open it. It's like, um, it keeps that door from being opened. Um, you would have to remove that metal frame in order to get that door off. Okay, and how do you, um, so the person... The person from the inside has to disengage the night lock. Is that, yes, is that that's do right. I have it right? Yes. Okay. So um, you you open the you close the door and you get the night lock and then what happens? Did you see anything in the hallway as you approached the hallway? Approached your door? No, I didn't. I shut the door. Um, I can hear that door shutting. It's completely silent. And I grab the night lock. And I look down at it, because depending on which way your door opens, depends on how it goes into the door. Um, and I see in my peripheral vision some movement. And so I, I look up. Um, and in that moment, um, I see someone wearing dark, baggy clothes. And are you... Seeing him through that window right there? Yes, it's okay. through. Um, Can you describe the person? Uh, the individual is wearing a hoodie, baggy clothes, um, a mask, and there was a, like a skull cap on, or, you know, like a... So were any parts of this individual's face visible? I did not see any part, I mean, only his eyes, and he was wearing glasses. Okay. Had you ever seen this person before? No. All right. And when you looked through the door, where was this person? How was he faced? Was he facing you? Was he to the side? Um, at the moment that I locked eyes with him, we were standing square to one another. Okay. Tell the jury about locking eyes with him um, and what you saw. So I lock eyes um, with this person, and I see some movement. Um, coming from his from the side of him, and I realize that he's raising a gun to me. Um, I remember thinking in my head, uh, "There's no orange tip on that gun." What does that mean? 
I, I had heard somewhere in my past that BB guns have an orange tip. Um, and my body reacted, and I, I jumped um, to the motioning, side. You're yes. motioning that you're, you jump to the right. I jumped to the right, so I'm jumping this way in the room. <coughs> and um, at this point, the door's closed? The door is closed, yes. Is there a window on the other side of this door, or just what no, we see? No, just okay. what you see. All right, you jump to the right, and then I, I jump. I'm, I'm turning, and I'm jumping to the right, and then I feel my shoulder move back. Um, it feels like I've been stung by hot water. Okay, you're pointing to something. What, yeah, on my just, arm. On your on your left arm. Yes. Okay. Um, At this point, did you manage to get the nightlock in already? No, the nightlock's in my hand. So he could have just opened the door. The door was locked. Okay. Like the the lock was okay. on it, right? Um, I look behind me and I see. You can see the bullet hole in the glass leading out to the courtyard. Um, and in my head, I remember thinking, a BB gun can't do that. Oh, uh, the instinct in my body was that I had to barricade this door. Um, but I'm afraid to go back to the door to put the night lock in. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Molly, I have to stop you for a second. When you, after you locked eyes and you see a gun, um, do you hear anything? Nothing. Okay. Oh, well, there were, sorry. That's okay. There were, it's, it's totally silent in the hallway, but I do hear three loud pops. They were, you could feel the force, like, coming, like, the way the door hit. It was very forceful, but the sound did not match the force. What do you mean by that? It was like higher pitched than um, than the power of what was happening through that door. When you jumped to the side, mm -hmm. you said then you just you looked and saw the bullet hole, and then what did you do next? There was a filing cabinet um, over on this side of the door against the wall, and so it's like a longer one, and so I grab it and I tr I'm trying to move it. And I'm realizing I can't move it. Um, but I know I have to get back and barricade that door. Okay. You were shot that day. I was. Yes. Okay. Um, and can you tell the jury and show the jury where you were shot? Yeah. Um, I'm going to remove this. That's okay. okay. Um. You can step down if you want to, it's okay. okay. Um, so, as you can see, it's kind of like on the back side of the arm. It's not straight forward. Like, you can't see the scar when I'm standing straight forward. So he, he caught me when I'm jumping on this side. He catches me. And there's, see, there's, there are two there's an entrance and an exit wound. And the line in the middle is uh, where, he, where the bullet cauterized my flesh. When you were trying to move the filing cabinet, at this point, did you um, I'm okay. did did you knew, had, did you know you were shot? I did not know. Okay. Were you feeling any anything physically? Um, no. I, I there was nothing physical. Um, I was so focused on I have to barricade this door. Um, <clears throat> And when I realized I couldn't move that filing cabinet, uh, I still had the nightlock in my hand. And so I got down on my hands and knees, and I crawled the length of the door, and I, I dropped uh, the nightlock in. And it made that, like, tink sound when it hit the ground. Um, and then I went... Talk to me about why you... Talk, why do you say that it made a sound? Was that significant to you? The only thing that I have to go on right now is um, what's happening in my space and what are my senses telling me. Um, it just sticks. Was there anything, could you see, smell, or hear anything else 
outside of your door. There was a smell of a cat, like a, what, like a cat gun might have smelled like. Or, um, but I, I'm not going back towards the window, right? I'm just dropping that in. And then I grab the rolling cart, which is also against that back wall, and I push it, and that's what you see in front of the door. So that piece of furniture is the rolling cart? Yes. Okay, and you could move that? Yeah, it was, it was really easy to move. It was just a push. Okay. Um, at this point, did you know you were shot? No. Okay, what happens next? Um, I'm concerned that he's going to come back around. Um, to those windows. So I, I know that I need to hide in that room. When you say those windows, the front ones or the back ones? The back ones. Okay. In the back. If you, so I'm trying to, I've barricaded the door. I'm trying to make myself invisible in that space. So I go back to that large filing cabinet. I move it just enough so that I can crawl behind it. And we can't see that here because it's to the left. So would, would you be able to see, would somebody looking in the, the, the window next to the door be able to see you? No, the cabinet was quite large and it was wide. Um, they would not have been able to see me behind that cabinet. Okay. At this point, did you realize you had been shot? Um, I knew I could start to feel blood rolling down my arm. Um, and I... What kind I of don't shot? think I was admitting that I was shot, right? It's, um, it's not so... It was so are out of what I knew to be what happens. Um, and so I just knew that if I was bleeding, I had to um, put a tourniquet on. But I can't get back to that bag that has uh, medical supplies in it. Um, so I removed my cardigan um, that I was wearing that day. And I used one of the sleeves uh, to tie around my arm. I put part of it in my mouth and the other part in my hand and I just tightened it around my um, upper arm. Were you feeling any pain at this point? No. Okay. The person that you saw raise the gun and shoot at you, did you, looking back then now, what was your impression of um, his use of the firearm? If anything. Your Honor, I'm going to object to that question. She, she's already testified she's not very familiar with firearms. I think that she would be speculating about his use at this point. Your Honor, I, I do want to acknowledge she's testified twice before, so I, I do know. I'm, I'm trying to, this is difficult. She, even though it's her third time, it's very hard for her. And so I'm trying to get her to um, answer my questions. Um, so <clears throat> we'll describe uh, yeah. what, what you noticed about him. Um, his feet were um, about hip distance apart. His shoulders were square, um, and he raised raised that gun right up. Um, it was probably a second from the moment that I locked eyes with him. Okay, just for the record, you're uh, raising your arm at, at um, a um, shoulder level. Was it two arms or one? I don't I don't know. I I just remember seeing the one arm, and my body instinctually moved. Okay, so. After you tied the tourniquet, mm -hmm. um, what what did you do? Were you hearing any announcements? Did you did you have a phone with you? Did you have a way of communicating with anyone? Um, I had my cell phone. Uh, there, the thing that I know to do is to barricade and listen. So I'm trying to figure out what to do next. I know that if we're in lockdown, 911's been called. I, there's a phone on that desk, but if I reach for it and he's there, he'll see me. Um, and then I'm worried about uh, what's happening in the front office. Um, I did, so I don't want to call up there. Um, and I text my husband. Um, I love you, active shooter. Within a few... Did, did you let anyone know that you had been shot? No, not at that point. Um, 
within a few minutes, I receive a text message from my daughter who went to school in a neighboring district. Through social media, she had heard that there was an active shooter at Oxford High School. Um, she said, Mom, are you okay? And I said, I'm sheltered in place. I'm safe. And I love you. Um, and I'm just listening to what's happening outside, trying to distinguish what, what's my next move. What are you hearing? Absolute silence. I'm hearing nothing. Were there any announcements? Uh, there wasn't another announcement that came on at one point, and it was to remain in lockdown. Um, I'm, there's a hallway text thread that we have that there's no one texting on that. But you there, mean the teachers yes, in that hallway in have a, a group text? Yes. Okay. Um, no one's texting on that. But in the other part of the building, my language arts team says, um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm hearing there's an active shooter. And I said, I saw one. Um, did I, you say, and I've been shot? I, I did not say that I was shot. Um, okay, is there a reason you're not telling anybody that you've been shot? Is that because you didn't want to really understand it, or...? I, do, I think that there's definitely a part of me that um, was in denial about what was happening to, in that moment. I also think that um, what I know is that building has to be secured to save the most amount of lives. And telling anyone that I'm shot when I'm not, when I do not need help, is not beneficial. So you didn't want anyone to help you? I was not. I did not need emergency medical attention at that moment. Or at least that's what I felt. Okay. okay. Uh, how long do you think you were in that classroom behind that cabinet? Um, I'm in there for about, I would say, 20 minutes. Um, and I'm sitting on my bum. Um, and at one point I hear footsteps in the hallway because my back's facing that hallway. And I think they're starting to evacuate those rooms. That was the decision, that was the moment I decided to text the teacher next door to me. She's in room 222. And I just said, um, uh, no one, no one knows right now, but I've been, sh I think I still use the word hit. I've been hit in the arm. Um, and then I did say, I, I hope there's no one else. Um, she then um, alerted. I, th I believe she called 911 and there was another teacher in the room with her and he alerted the front office. So at some point did you, did somebody come to try to um, help you? Uh, it was pretty quickly after I sent a text message to them that um, Kurt Noose, who was our assistant principal at the, at the time, that he shows up at my door knocking, um, Molly, Molly, are you in there? Um, and from behind that, that filing cabinet, I, I said, yes. Um, Kurt was, I've known Kurt since I started in Oxford, but I didn't trust that that was Kurt in that moment. Um, so you didn't want to open the door? I did not want to open the door. It felt safer to stay in there. Um, and then a few seconds after, there's uh, police officers at the door. And uh, they're like, Is, are, are you injured? And I, I said, yes. Um, and so they asked me to, uh, I think I said, do you want me to, I kind of like crawled out from behind. And um, I was like, do you want me to, do you want me to take the night lock out? Um, and they said yes. Do you want me to open the door? And they said yes. And I, I'm still on my hands and knees at this point. And they reach up for the handle. Oh, and that door swings open. And they grab me from under my arms. 
and they pull me up and out of the classroom. And I can see Kurt standing on the lockers, like a, um, against the lockers. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been admitted as Exhibit 11. What is that line? Uh, that's them at my door. And that's them walking me out. You can see that, uh, there were multiple police that were around that door when they pulled me out. Um, and then the two escort me out door four. Um, we get outside of door four and the one says, I'm going to put a, a real tourniquet on you now. Um, it might hurt a bit. And then is is that what's happening right through the window? You can see in the yes. video. Yes. Okay. And then they said we're going to call um, and see if there's an ambulance available for you. Uh, we need to know. We need to know if uh, someone needs it more than you. Okay. When you came out, you you see you, we see somebody there, um, an officer with a a, a weapon. Mm -hmm. um, did, were there anybody else? Was there anybody else in the hallway? Were there any students? Were there was there... no one in the hallway. It was completely silent, with the exception of a walkie or two that was going off. And what information did you have at that point about the shooter? Or did you know somebody, if they're, they're still in the building? Did you know if there were victims? What did you know? I have no idea about anything. But when he says, we're going to see if there's someone else, I think it was the moment that I knew that. There was someone else. When you got outside, what did you see or hear? Um, there's a helicopter flying above the building. Um, there's a couple snowbanks. Did you see any students? There were a smattering of people throughout the parking lot. I honestly couldn't tell you if they were students or parents. Okay. Um, Eventually, did you get into an ambulance? I did. And where did where were you taken? I was taken up here, um, hospital, or the hospital up here. Okay. And what happened when you got there? Um, we get to up here, and um, I asked to walk in. Um, I felt like if I could walk, I wanted to walk. And so, uh, they supported me to walk me into the hospital. And as I'm walking in, the hallways are lined with doctors and nurses. Like, they were, they were prepared for a disaster. Okay. What did you learn about your injury that day? <laughs> um, it was through and through. Um, it was clean. They ended up doing a, a chest x-ray on me in the hospital to make sure that no debris from the bullet came in. And that was probably the first moment that I cried because I felt like I had made a mistake in the classroom. And then I had actually put my life in danger. I didn't know if I was hit somewhere else. What, what, what do you mean by made a mistake? I didn't know if I was hit somewhere else. I couldn't understand why they were doing a chest x-ray on me. Okay. Were you released that day? I was. Um, my husband came up to the hospital to come get me. Um, we went home that night. Okay. Uh, at some point, were you informed or shown where those shots landed? Yeah. Um, He was aiming to kill me. Um, those shots were intended. Okay. I want to mm -hmm. back up. When did you learn where those shots landed other than you knew it hit your arm? Uh, my husband was my nurse at home, taking care of uh, cleaning my wound. Um, and at some point when, you know, I'm holding him out, I, I realized 
Uh, that's a heart level. Um, and he was even. <coughs> okay. How many inches is it from your heart, Molly? I would say about six. Okay. At some point, were you shown the picture of your door that depicted? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember when that was? Yeah. Um, I saw that photo um, in your office. Okay. When you came in months ago to talk mm -hmm. about the testimony. All right, Molly, um, I'm showing you what's been in Minna's Exhibit 12. Um, <coughs> is that the classroom, your classroom door? It is. Okay. And the, the pink uh, rods, do you know what those indicate? The bullets that came through the door. Okay. And when you saw that in my office, what did you say? He was aiming to kill me. That's a shot to the head and to the chest. Nothing further. I ask you to tell the jury what Alice is. Oh, th thank you. Um, Alice is a protocol that we follow. I, if I could remember the entire acronym, I would um, tell you, but it's like um, we have to listen and make alert. We have to make a decision. Are we going to lock down in place? Are we going to flee the scene? Or are we going to have to go on the attack uh, that like someone would come in the room? Um, so it's just kind of dependent upon the situation and what decision we choose to make um, in a in a situation like that. Thank you. Cross, Ms. Lehman. Nothing wrong. May she be excused, Your Honor? Yes, you can step down when you're excused. Our next witness involves the exhibits that we spoke about earlier today. Okay. <coughs> so, we have a little uh, setup here. Uh, we, we, we are ahead of schedule, I believe. Um, there are certain things that need to be set up for your view, so we're going to take that away, okay? All rise for the jury.
Are you guys all set? Yes, sir. Thank you. Your Honor, calling people versus James Crumbly, case number 22279989FH. Thank you. Good morning. Mark Keyes on behalf of people. Karen McDonald on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Murray Elliman on behalf of James Crumbly, who is standing to my left. I was trying to beat the arrival of their lunch. So. Ms. Williams, what's the TV on? And the volume turned up as well? Oh, this one is on. testimony about the bill is the truth so help you out. Yes, ma'am. All right, you may be seated. And then would you state for the name, your name for the record and spell your first and last name. Name is Edward Wolgorowski, E-D-W-A-R-D, last name W-A-G-R-O-W-S-K-I. Go ahead, prosecutor. Thank you. Sir, how are you employed? I currently work with the U.S. Secret Service. And what do you do there? I, the title is a network intrusion forensic analyst. I do computer forensics, cell phone forensics, Network intrusion stuff as well. And how long have you been working with the United States Secret Service? Two months now. And prior to that, where did you work? I worked with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. And what did you do there? Uh, before, I was in a computer crimes unit. Okay. So before, I take it you retired from the Sheriff's Office? Yes, I did. Okay. And before retiring, how long did you spend there? Uh, at the, my entire time there was 28 years. I was in the computer crimes unit for 10 years. Now, if you could tell us, please, what a detective with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office Computer Crimes Unit would do on a day-to-day -day basis. On a day-to-day -day basis, our job was if, uh, electronic evidence, whether it's a cell phone, computer, um, DVRs from a business, whatever it may be, we were the ones that handled that. We were the ones that had the training how to get the data from that or get the video from it or interpret call detail records. Okay. So... Exhibit 43, it's been admitted, it's your, your CV, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but is it fair to say that you've had specific training for your role there? Yes, sir. Okay, tell us about some of that. Uh, the, the main training that we go to it, with the Sheriff's Office was, um, there's an organization called IASIS to, to, to become a certified forensic computer examiner. Um, that has a six-month testing process after two weeks of training at their training event once a year. Um, uh, on top of that, for cell phones, there's other agencies, um, Celebrate has uh, training they do for the tools that, that we use from them, um, and other agencies as far as uh, PACC. When you say Celebrate, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Celebrate's a company, and they develop software and have tools to uh, extract data from phones and then interpret that data. Okay. Um, how often in your employment with the Sheriff's Office and with Secret Service would you say that you actually analyze cell phones? Almost every day. That's what we do. Okay. So you went through a lot of, um, just now a very quick rendition of uh, detectives' work with the Computer Crimes Unit. I didn't catch most of that. Can you simplify a little bit, little, little, little bit of that for me? Um, I, I mean, so we get the data from the phones, and then we have to take that data and put it in a format that uh, a, a, an officer in charge of a case, an OIC, is able to look at easily instead of sitting there scrolling through the phone, potentially changing data, we put it in a format, we take it off of there. When you say data, what do you mean by data? The, everything on the phone, anything. Um, text messages, call logs, pictures, videos, anything, that we, anything that's on the phone. So the goal as a detective, when you take a, somebody's phone, I take it that's um, via search warrant? Via search warrant or consent, yes. Okay, so if there's a judicial authority for you to look inside the phone, then what do you do with it? Uh, depending on whether the phone is locked or not, uh, we use methods to obtain the passcodes and then extract the data or the call logs and the messages and all that stuff 
And then that's, like I said before, we put in a format that is easier to look at. Okay. And what's the overall, the overarching goal of a detective in a computer crimes unit? What do you, what's the goal to obtain that information for? Oh, to, I mean, the over, what you want to obtain is all the evidence, if there is any, to, for prosecution. Um, you want to make sure you get everything that is possibly on that phone to turn over to either the officer in charge of the case who will turn it over to the prosecutor's office. Okay. So you're with the Secret Service now. Yes. Um, in this field, the specific field, do you work with other agencies as well? Yes, sir. Tell us about that, please. Uh, it, same as with the sheriff's office. Any agency that reaches out that doesn't have the means to, to have the tools to, to get data off of phones, we just help them with it. Okay. So we, we started to talk a little bit about your training in uh, computer forensics. Have you been qualified as an expert in the past in this field? Yes, I have. How many times? 14 times. In what areas? Uh, cell phone forensics, uh, computer forensics, and then uh, call detail record analysis. Okay. What's call detail record analysis? Call detail records are what you get from your carrier. If you have AT&T or T-Mobile, via search warrant, you send it off, a search warrant off to the carrier to get information on the specific phone number, what towers they used, um, where the device might have been, stuff like that. Okay. You mentioned cell sites? And, yeah, cell tower location. What's that mean? The cell site to cell tower location is, um, it, it's an antenna for your phone, sort of like it is for your car. Um, they're all over the place, wherever, um, probably within a mile of each other, half a mile of each other, depending on the population of the area. Um, but it gives us the, the exact location where that cell tower is. Okay. So in your over 10 years of experience working with uh, the digital extraction of data from cell phones, would you say this field has changed? Yes. Okay. Is your training continuing? Yes, sir, it does. Why is that? Well, just because the, the information changes. Where, where an app might store information within that, the, the program itself, the, the little program, might change on every update. So we have to know where we can go to to find it if the tool can't find it for us. Okay, when you say the tool, what's that mean? The Celebrate software, um, either um, the physical analyzer software or other methods to get the information off the phone. So then would it be fair to say that that as technology has, has changed and evolved over time, so is the training of computer crimes detectives? Yes, sir. Okay. And is that training continuing? Always. Judge, so this time I'm going to move to qualify this witness as an expert in the field of cell phone forensics and historical cell site analysis. Okay, he said computer forensics, cell phone forensics, car detail analysis, are those the areas? Uh, call, that's what he's been qualified in the past, called detail records, but in this particular case, He's going to be qualified as an expert in the field of cell phone forensic, forensics and historical cell site analysis, Judge. Historical cell phone. <coughs> no objection, Your Honor. Um, you may consider um, this witness as an expert in the area of historical, historical cell phone analysis and cell phone forensic analysis. Thank you, Judge. Mm -hmm. Cell site analysis. Cell site. Thank you, Judge. Uh, sir, you mentioned that the overall goal is to extract as much information as possible. That'd be right. That's correct. Okay. So, in a digital investigation, would you confine yourself to just the cell phone? No. Okay. So, what else? What other areas would you look for information? Um, I mean, outside the cell phone, that the call detail record isn't stored in the phone. We have to reach out to the cell carrier, um, a particular app, uh, whether it's Facebook Messenger or Instagram or whatever, we have to we can search warrant them to get information from for somebody's account. Okay. Now, if you could tell the jury a little bit, please, about what a cell phone does that might not be commonly known. Um, I mean, when you're not using it, when you're not interacting with it and swiping up and down and stuff like that, it could be updating your email. You know, because you don't always tell the phone to update; it just does it by itself or it's talking to a cell tower to know exactly where you might be in case it needs to send you a message or it knows whether you're not in range or not so it knows the carrier knows to so hold on to that message. There's a lot going on in the background that people just you know, don't know the function's happening but yet it's continually happening. Is that why a, while a phone's powered on? Oh yes. Okay, so what happens if a phone's powered off? Nothing. It, it can't do anything. It can't receive information. It can't send information. Okay. Now what about Android phones specifically? Have you had the opportunity to be trained in data extraction from Android phones? Yes, sir. Okay. Is that the same as Apple phones? Uh, iPhones? Not entirely. The, how, how the operating system is written, it's, uh, it, 
It, it's a little different in the process of getting the data off of the phones. What do you mean? Um, on Android phones, it's, it's a little bit easier to get the data off of a phone than it is an Apple phone. You said operating system. What does that mean? The, the main function. The, what, when you look at the phone, the, what, the main screen, that's the, that's the like Windows for your computer, right? Or, or um, iOS for your, for your Mac or whatever. The operating system is the base of that phone, whether it's Android or an Apple which uses iOS, um, an Apple phone. That's the main thing that makes the phone function. Okay, and I think you said that Android operates differently than Apple? Yes, it does. Okay, can you explain that to me again, please? Uh, it operates a little different on how, um, how it stores data, how it retains that data, whether it's a file-based encryption, whether it's even encrypted at all, depending on the, the phone that you have, the manufacturer of that phone, um, and where it stores that data. Now, are you able to obtain someone's uh, locations based upon a device? A you phone? can, yes. Tell me how that works. Uh, the phone... The phone's always looking where you are. Obviously, it's talking with towers. The tower tells the phone where it's at. Um, for advertising purposes, um, let's say Google, for example, they put those little cookies on your phone so it knows where you're at all the time, right? And it knows that you like going to Burger King. So every time your phone knows that it's near Burger King because the map app is being used, it's going to tell you, oh, there's a Burger King nearby, or it'll pop up in your Facebook message feed or whatever. Um, so that's, yeah. All right, cookies, what's that? Those are little... Little trackers, I guess, to make it simple. It's a little tracker that, that sits, that's embedded in whatever, however the phone interacts with either the internet or an application. It's a little, it's a little nugget that just sits on your phone, waiting to be activated, to um, tell either uh, Google where you're at, Apple where you're at, um, and to give the user a better experience with their phone. So. If I'm, if I'm on my phone and looking at a website, for example, and I get that little bar at the bottom that says this website uses cookies, mm -hmm. accept or yes or no. Yep. So if I either hit yes or I close out of the, that box, then it's tracked on my phone. If you hit yes, correct. Okay. What if I hit no? What happens? Then the cookies, they're usually, they're not installed because you're not given permission for them to be, you know, loaded up to your phone, not installed, loaded to your phone. So in order for me to look at the website, for example, though, I'd have to hit yes. Not necessarily, no. Okay. No. So... This is something that, as an investigator in this field, you're able to use to help understand the location of the device? Correct, yes. Okay, and tell me how that works, though. Uh, well, like I said, the, the, one of the main things, one of the main things that we use is what's called location services. Uh, I'm sorry. Location services is what tracks where your phone is within either an Apple or an Android phone. Um, Google stores that data, again, because it sells that data to Burger King or... Like that, wherever that you might want to, you know, you're in, whatever you're interested in, and it, that, it keeps track of where you have been, where you like to go to use that information in the future. Okay. So I want to talk about specific to this case. I want to talk about some of the evidence that you reviewed in this case. Um, first of all, were cell phones seized in the course of, the, of this investigation? Yes, there was. Okay. And you were the individual, you and members of your team had the opportunity to review those cell phones? That's correct. Um, what about information from social media outlets? Yes, we did. Okay. Now, regarding the cell phones, I'm going to summarize this, and I want you to tell me if this is accurate, okay? So, source of electronic information from the shooter, an Android phone, a T-Mobile phone, last four digits, 1551. Correct. Yep. That's right? Yes, sir. Okay. A Facebook account? Correct. And an Instagram account? That's correct. Okay. Now, regarding Jennifer Crumbly, there were three cell phone seeds, is that right? Correct. Okay. So we have um, two from T-Mobile with the same identical phone number. Is that right? Okay. Um, a TCL A509DL, we refer to as a burner phone. What, is it, what does that mean? A burner phone is what we refer to. It's a phone that you can go to Walmart in the electronic section where they sell their TVs or any uh, CVS or Rite Aid. And just buy it in a packaging and activate it. The SIM card's in there, and there's really no uh, account that's needed to, to get it up and going. You just activate the phone by putting money uh, towards the account within it. Okay. A uh, Facebook account, um, jehn.crumbly.7. And you, we have, includes the messenger functions. What do you mean by that? Uh, so Facebook message, fa Facebook messenger and Facebook, you know, separate, it's two separate platforms. But you can search warrant Facebook for messenger information, or you just search warrant for messenger information. Okay. 
And then we have a certain emails account from Gmail and Yahoo. Correct. All right. And then Instagram, Instagram account, jehnc 78 Correct. Okay. So regarding James Crumbly, again, three phones were seized, two of which were T-Mobile phones with the same phone number, and the third being the TCL A509DL burner phone. Correct. Okay. One Instagram account, James R. Crumbly. One Facebook account, which included the messenger function, James R. Crumbly. And Yahoo, Gmail, Charter Communications email accounts? Correct. Okay. And then DoorDash search warrant for James Crumley. So was the search warrant issued to DoorDash? Yes, it was. Okay. And was information received? Yes, it was. Okay. So we, we spoke about that very briefly early. A search warrant is when a judge or magistrate authorizes um, a document to a, a social media provider or a company, for example, and information is returned. Correct. Okay. And so what happens when you get that return? It, Sometimes it's in an easy format. It's just a simple Excel spreadsheet. Other times it's uh, multiple Excel spreadsheets that you have to compare different parts of that uh, uh, two spreadsheets to come up with the information. Okay. Now, your role normally would be to talk about cell phones, computers, cell towers, things like that. Correct. Okay. So, with your permission, I'd like to talk to you about November the 30th, 2021. Do you remember that day? Yes. Okay. You were working for the Sheriff's Office? Yes, I was. Okay. And you were computer crimes? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, were you working that day? Yes. 12.50, 12.51 in the afternoon on November the 30th. Do you remember where you were? It's probably driving pretty fast. Okay. And tell me why. Um, we got news from our captain that there was a shooting at the Oxford High School. Prior to that, we, uh, our sergeant who was off that day, um, reached out, texted one of the guys in the office, and said there was a shooting at the high school, and and nobody believed it. Like we believed it, but we're like, that's eh, just somebody nearby at a house, you know, fired off a rifle or something, and the police are going to go do their job. And then a couple, couple minutes go by, and the captain comes in and he goes, he said there's been a shooting at the high school, and he said all hands on deck. Okay. What did you take that to me? There's a shooting. Like it was. All hands on deck. You're not normally somebody who responds to active shooter situations, right? No, it's, no, no, it's over the nerds. Um, no. Um, when, for the captain to come to the computer crimes office, it was all due respect to the guys in there and the gals in there. Um, that's not their job to, to deal with that. Um, the fact that he came in there, was it was a really big deal. Okay. And you mentioned you were driving pretty fast. Tell me about that. Um, I remember... I remember getting out to my car at the time I had a white minivan that had lights and siren in it. No one ever took it seriously when we turned the lights and siren on. But I remember going out of the parking lot and I looked to my left and there's, uh, I, again, it, it didn't seem real. It didn't seem like this, like I'm, I'm thinking in my head like this is just blown out of proportion. Because I didn't have my radio on in the car. I couldn't hear the radio traffic at the time. And, uh, I looked to my left and there's two patrol cars, not even from our agency, not even from the sheriff's office, come around the far corner on this complex by the medical examiner's office and the, and the um, animal control. And they turned that corner on two wheels on each side of the pack, coming around that corner, their lights were sighted, they were going fast. And I'm like, holy, holy cow, this is real. So then I, I, uh, I turned my lights on because I just thought we'd get there and do what Computer Crimes does, you know? We would do our thing. And I turned my lights on and siren. And I started going north towards uh, Walton. Telegraph runs up to Walton and it cuts over to M20, US 24. Telegraph cuts up to Walton and it goes over to M24. And I had no idea where the heck I was going. I've never, I've, I've been to Oxford for a half a second driving through. Um, and I, I, I thought, well, I remember they, when I get there, I'll just, I'll just follow the crowd because it's going to be big. 
And uh, going north on 24, and I see uh, see one of our SWAT vehicles going across that bridge from 75 down to 24. And the light was red for me, and I thought, well, I'm going to have to slow down. Like, there's cars coming down the ramp. And I remember getting closer and closer, thinking, how come nobody's going? Like, my light's red. This tra cross traffic should be going. Like, because you... As a police officer, obviously, when you when you run a red light, it's it's extremely dangerous. You just you don't do it haphazardly. And I'm approaching this light, thinking I'm gonna have to slow down. And uh, try, I, as I as I get to the light, I look over and there's a patrol car just sitting. I don't know what agency they work for. And so I just I go through that intersection, and then I see them join up behind me, and then I see two other patrol cars from another agency coming up behind me. I remember, I don't know if it was. Brown Road or what the next major crossroad up the hill there. Um, I remember that light was red and there were cars stopped in both lanes and I thought to myself, I'm going to have to go onto the shoulder. And so I'm looking at the shoulder thinking, I mean, it's part dirt. It's, it's a small shoulder of asphalt and dirt and my small tires on that minivan, it's not going to handle well, but... We're not going to stop going, right? So... I I remember feeling this steering wheel shaking from the gravel, and I get around and keep driving north, keep driving north. Crowd still following me. I I look up in the mirror every once in a while, and there had to have been I got I couldn't count them. They were so far deep behind me, and then the ambulances and the SWAT vehicle, and we get up into town, up into Oxford, I think we were. And uh, as I'm approaching the light, um, it just changes red. So obviously cross traffic doesn't know what's going on there. You might just have somebody that just goes straight and again, it's dangerous, it's, it, it really is. And so with the lead car, I've always been told the lead car in a situation like that, you always hold that intersection for everybody else behind you because they're coming. And so as I, I entered into the intersection, I stopped dead in the intersection with the lights and siren going. And I counted 16, at least 16 vehicles just go screaming past me and we get we start getting into town, and northbound traffic's blocked. Um, it's dead stopped. Um, I remember going against oncoming traffic, and now uh, you, you see cars coming at you, you know, and you're, you're the whole way there. All I could hear on the radio was uh, uh, staging area on Ray Road, Meyer. That's what I kept on hearing. There was so much radio traffic. I heard bits and pieces of other things, but that like really stuck in my head. And so we're just driving north, and finally, I just see a mire, and I'm like, okay, well, we got to be far enough north. This is where I got to go. Um, and so I, I pull up onto Ray Road, and I meet up with other deputies in the area. Okay. If you could describe to us what you saw when you arrived at that mire. That was tough. That was really tough. I got a daughter who, uh, she's 17, 18 years old, and, you know, 17 year olds, you know, they wear those tight leggings and all that stuff and small shirts or whatever. And I remember standing there on Ray Road, and I see these kids. One kid didn't even have a shoe on, he only had one shoe on, walking through the snow bank, going down to the mire. And uh, I see these girls dressed like my daughter. And it was cold that day. I had two coats on, and I was shaking. I was shivering. It was so cold. Um, I remember offering one of our lieutenants at the time. He didn't have a coat. And I offered one of my coats because I was so cold, and he, he didn't take it. Um, but you just saw these kids just coming down from where the school was. Like It's hard to describe. They, they, look, like, they look like zombies. Like They had no, no facial expression, nothing. So there were kids there. Were their parents at the Meyer Zoo? Uh, down by the garden center. Um, I, the crowd was heading that way, and it was it was it was chaos. It was it really was. You didn't. I really didn't know what to do once I got there. I didn't know where the school was, even though it was just up the street. Um, and uh, so everybody was walking to the garden center. So I started going that way. And at first, way we were told to start getting people to sign their name into notebooks. Um, we were just grabbing them off the shelves in the mire and boxes of pens and stuff and just write their names in the notebooks for whatever, I don't know why they needed that. So I'm trying to walk around and get this information from people. And uh, then they started yelling, 
Um, someone starts yelling, you know, get everybody inside, get everybody inside. So I, I go back outside to try to usher people in. And I remember just seeing, like, kids just standing there. And you put your arm on them. You don't want to, you know, they just been through this, whatever happened up there. And I don't want to force them. I'm not going to grab them. I'm not going to make them do anything they don't want to do. So I sort of, like, if they didn't move, I just left them. I, you know, they, they were okay. They weren't in harm's way. And I remember seeing parents just standing there. And I, because these school buses started arriving. And I, I remember thinking, my like, God, that is just crazy. Why the heck are there school buses? I, I didn't know anything about the plan when something, if something like this happened at the school. And so, and I just see the parents, like, You see them just uh, almost praying in their head that their kid came off the bus. After you helped with, with the names and the notebooks, did you go to the school? Yes, I did. Okay. And were you directed to go to school or did you just know that's where you were needed? No, um, one of the other detectives, uh, Jeff Enger, uh, he he went, responded to the school and he called me on my phone and uh, said they were trying to get the video uh, from the surveillance cameras in the school. And at the time, I was a little more versed in that in that side of the job, um, and so he just wanted a little help with that. Okay. So, tell me about you arrived at the school. Uh, where did you initially go? Uh, I went to what is, would be the north side of the school. Uh, there's a big circle drive there. And it's the side that like the the main office is on of the school, um, and I, again there were patrol cars there. There were everybody everywhere. I remember driving up over the sidewalk, thinking I, I the side I remember like the stuff I remembered like the sidewalk being so high. I thought it was to rip the muffler off my car. I don't know why I thought about that. And I go up over the sidewalk and I just stopped my car because that's what seemed like everybody was doing. Um, and I walk in the door, and one of our sergeants is standing there, providing security just for that door so people aren't coming in. They shouldn't be coming in or whatever. Um, and I asked him where the uh, security office was, because that's where Detective Edgar told me he was, and um, pointed me to the office, and people eventually pointed me back to the security office. Okay. And who did you encounter when you went there? Uh, as I walked in, I remember seeing um, this, the security officer, Jim Rourke, was in there. Um, Deputy uh, Jason Lewert was there. I didn't know him at the time. Um, ATF agent Brett Brandon was in the room. Right here behind you. Yep. And uh, Lieutenant Mars Band was in the room. And you said at that point you were called over to help with the security footage. That's correct. Okay, so tell me what your role was at that point. Um, I, well, obviously, the bosses are going to want to know what happened, where it started, all the all that information. And I, I wasn't given any direction, we weren't given direction, but we just had to figure out when it started, where it started, how it started, as much as we can because they're going to want to know that information. And so we just started reviewing video footage. <clears throat> um, at that point in time, was the high school still being cleared? Yes, it was. Okay. And when I say being cleared, we haven't had another officer testify yet. What does that mean? Uh, to clear something, you're going to look for, for more bad guys. You're going to look for maybe bombs that might have been placed, um, someone um, hiding in a, in a room because they know the police are there, you know, so they're checking every room, every closet, everything in a high school, going door by door, checking it all. So tell me how it is that you went about your job that you were called there to do that day. Uh, Jim Rourke, um, like I said, he was a head of security. Um, and they had a system where you didn't actually interact with the DVR system itself, you interacted through a portal, uh, a web page, um, to access the server where the video was stored at. And thank goodness he was very well versed in that. So I immediately, you know, I told him, I said, well, you got to help me figure this out because I don't know what's going on here. Um, so Jim and I sat there, um, went to went to the hallway that started, and uh, um, tried to determine at what time the shooter went in there. So how many uh, cameras approximately? Did Oxford High School have equipped for surveillance footage? Well, they released 100 cameras. Okay. And it was your responsibility to review that footage? Yes, it was. Okay. Judge, this might be time for a natural break. Oh, all right. Um, well, the jury's lunch is here.
solid um, that, that is probably work. I'm not sure if I call you sergeant, detective, lieutenant, mister, hey you, none of those. Okay, all right. Um, you should not discuss your testimony because you're, you're still on the scene right now, so please don't discuss your, your testimony with anyone. All right, so you can step down. If I give you till 1.15, is that okay? Okay, um, you're, those who ordered lunches, your lunches are here, all right? Do not discuss the case with anyone, don't text anyone, right? Okay. All right, to the jury.
Thank you. 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 Thank
was to try to secure the video that, of what had happened in the hallway where the shooting started. And you said that there were a number of cameras operational at Oxford High School? That yes, time? yes there was. Okay. So, in securing the video, what specifically were you asked to do? We weren't really asked to do anything. We just, I assumed what the bosses, the, the, the sheriff and the under all of them would want to know um, is where it started. Uh, we knew it started in the 200 hallway. Um, and we saw as the shooter came out, but we were trying to figure out when he went into the bathroom. So what did you do to accomplish this goal? The shooter came out of the bathroom with a black coat on. Uh, we kept on hit, you know, rewinding five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and watched all the way through looking for him to go into the bathroom. And we didn't know the shooter's name at the time. Um, then we could never find somebody going into the bathroom wearing what the shooter had when he came out. Um, somebody told us who, what his name was, and so we had knew that he was in the counselor's office earlier in the day. So we went all the way back to the time he was coming out of the counselor's office to determine what he was wearing before he went to the bathroom. That's how we were able to figure out when he did go in. Okay, so you were able to eventually identify the shooter? Yes. <clears throat> now, are you the, the person who actually synced together the camera footage for other investigators? Yes, I was. Okay, and tell me, how was it that you were able to do that? With over 100, at least 100 cameras in the school, you just take clips of each one. As they move from one camera, you go to the next camera and save that section, and then there's software that I use to just thread them all together. And then you, you testified earlier that, that um, you were aware that um, the shooter was in his counselor's office. Were you also aware that James and Jennifer Crumbly with Oxford High School that day? At that time... I, yes, I was. Yes, okay. I'm sorry. And eventually, were you requested to obtain as much surveillance video footage from that point in time? Is it good? <clears throat> yes. Sir, I'm okay. going to object to leading. It's just the foundational job. All right, sustain. Okay. Now, in the immediate days after the shooting, what was your primary responsibility with regard to the video? Uh, different things came up. Uh, there was a rumor going around that. The shooter had actually tried opening doors, you know, and identifying himself as the police. Well, that was actually the police, but I had to go up there and get more video footage just to determine how far he went completely down the hallway before he turned around, um, and then what had happened uh, in the surrounding hallways and such like that. And as the investigator had put, synced together the, the video, did you have to watch the video of the shooting itself? Yes, sir. All told, how many hours of video do you think you've watched to put this together? Too many. How many different angles did you have to see this from? Every angle, every every camera. There's some cameras that pointed back in one direction from where that it started to I don't know. I don't know. Seven different angles, maybe different times. In part of putting that footage together, were you aiding in the identification of the victims? Yes. Tell us what you saw in the video. Started at 12.51. The shooter came out of the bathroom. I'll never forget it. He came out of that bathroom like what I've referred to before in other in my life, like, like a proud chest, like his shoulders were back. And he comes out of the bathroom, and there's Phoebe and her boyfriend just standing right there. And he takes the gun he, as he comes out of the bathroom, and he turns and levels the gun and fires at Phoebe and hits her in the shoulder and fires at her boyfriend, um, hitting him in his hand as he raises his hand from seeing the gun, I would imagine. Um, then... To his right, immediately, right there, uh, was um, Hannah St. Juliana and Kylie and, and Riley. And he, uh, he started shooting at them, and they fell on top of each other. And in the distance, in the camera, you can see the uh, far end of the angle. You see what I 
found out to be was uh, Madison Baldwin, and she uh, she like she crouched down like I don't know if it was I don't know if it was in I don't know why she did it, but it was in the fetal position, and the shooter ran right up to her, and uh, he put the gun right on her head. She just fell over. You, uh, he rounds the corner into the longer part of the 200 hallway. Prior to running towards Madison, he had just fired down the hallway, just, I don't know, just trying to hit anybody that was running out of there. He rounds the corner and starts shooting. You see a whole bunch of kids, and you see a, you see a whole bunch of teachers standing at doors, just grabbing kids as they ran by and just throwing them into a room. And then uh, there's two girls. One you see, she, she runs up to a door and tries pulling it open, but the people inside had already put the safety latch at the bottom of the door, and she couldn't get it open. Meanwhile, the shooter's still walking towards, and another girl comes from the right side of the frame and grabs the other one by the arm and just tears off down the hallway. Meanwhile, the shooter is shooting at them. The shooter continues, keeps walking down the hallway past the 200, I think it was a 400T intersection, I think is what that was. Um, and he, he, he levels the gun. And he fires two rounds, and at first I didn't know what he was shooting at. And when you go to the section of video of that time was, is when, uh, when Tate Near just comes in, and un unknowing to him, he had no idea what, had hap what was happening. And the shooter leveled the gun, and just as Tate turned the corner, the shooter fired a round. And Tate fell instantly. The shooter took a couple steps and then leveled the gun again. And just to, just to shoot Tate again, laying there, shot him. And you see Tate's body flinch. He then, uh, he then walks over Tate. Um, at the top of the frame, you see his feet stop, the shooter's feet. And he turns towards a room that, looking at the frame, would be on the left, or would have been his left. Um, and come to find later on, he had fired into a classroom where a teacher was. He continues on down the hallway, um, almost uh, hunting for more victims or, or whatever. And he gets past a certain point and there's no one else to shoot at because everybody had ran out of the school. They, every door, every possibility, every lock, door locked, whatever. And you see him turn around and he stops at a classroom that based on where the door is, you can't see deep into the, deep into the room. It's like the room goes that way but he can only see straight in. Well, as he's walking back this way, he can see the kids, I'm imagining, hiding in that corner because he stops and fires off a few rounds through the glass. He then uh, comes back, walking towards where Tate was lying. Um, at this time, uh, an assistant principal was laying there, or standing there uh, next to Tate. And sh the shooter just walks past her with the gun in his hand, and she said something to him. I'm not sure what she said, but you could tell, like, he turned his head, like, almost... Didn't even look at her. Turned his head like in, in shame. I don't know. Um, and then he keeps on walking down the hallway to uh, the bathroom where the uh, uh, the other Justin Shilling was. Um, and he just, as he gets to the bathroom, he just stops and turns right and just goes right to the bathroom. Okay. <clears throat> did the shooter eventually exit the bathroom? Yes, he did. Before he did, did somebody else exit the bathroom? Yes, another student. Okay. Tell me what you saw there. That student, he was 
I don't, I don't know how else to say it, but I've never seen somebody, never seen somebody actually run for their life. And that kid was running for his life. Now, did the shooter eventually exit the bathroom himself? Yes, he does. Tell me about that. He comes out of the bathroom, and he looks around a little bit, see what's going on. Um, turns around and uh, the, the, the bathroom, the doors sit back in like a cubby type area, so they're off the hallway, the main hallway you really can't see, but he turns back around. And eventually now, um, the two first responding deputies um, had gotten Jason Lewert and Jens um, were coming down the hallway. And Lewert was a little bit faster than Jens was just because he was trying to cover more ground. You can see Tate laying on the ground. Um, and Jens is walking a little bit slower. As, they, as he's walking up to him, the shooter just puts his hands up in the air and goes down to his knees. As he's doing that, Jens realizes he sees something and he, he yells, he yelled, gun, from what he told me. Um, and the shooter then lays down on his stomach and Jason Lure come back and that's where they take him into custody right there. Based upon your, your video review, and you said you've had to watch hours of this? Yes, sir. Um, is it fair to say that the entire incident was about nine minutes long? Yes, sir. Yeah. He was taken in custody at 1300. Yes. 1 o'clock. I'm sorry. What, sorry, at 1251. He was taken in custody at 1 p.m. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. I'm going to go through some of the evidence that you recovered in your um, forensic uh, investigation. We talked about different information that you were able to draw upon from James Crumbly's phone, Jennifer Crumbly's phone, and the shooter's phone, as well as their social media accounts and emails. Yes, right? that's correct. So you've seen all of the bits of every exhibit in this case you've seen, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And you've seen the demonstrative portions of those exhibits in this PowerPoint. PowerPoint for it too. Correct. Okay. So you're aware, and everyone's aware, we have a citation with the evidence uh, number on that slide, as well as a citation to where from um, these sources of electronic information was pulled from. Correct. Okay. Yes. Now, from what you reviewed of the exhibits, do they fairly and accurately depict the information that you extracted from the social media accounts and from the devices themselves? Yes, it does. They do. So we'll start in um, late winter or early spring of 2021. Mr. Keys, can I just ask you, this, this source of electronic information, which exhibit is this specific? This is not an exhibit. This is just a demonstrative aid for, oh, okay. for the research. Right. Thank you. So we'll start with um, March 8th. 2021. Before we get into that, a little bit of background. You were able to obtain a Facebook Messenger chat between James and Jennifer Crumley? That's correct. And, and tell, me, tell me how you were able to obtain that. Uh, uh, you, like we talked about earlier, you can send search warrants off um, after authorization from a judge to obtain information on someone's social media accounts or phone numbers. Okay. And did that happen in this case? Yes, it did. So I'm going to show you what's been admitted as, this is People's 44. Sir, what are we looking at here? That's a Facebook chat from between James and Jennifer, and the green would be James Crumbly, and the blue would be Jennifer's. Okay, so we won't do this with every slide, but just so we are on the same page here. It says, from Facebook, 69147344 J.C. Rumbly. What does that mean? The numbers is the... Um, ID account that is signed by Facebook, and then the JC Rumbly is the screen name that was chosen by the user. Okay, and then we have in the, the bottom of the text bubble we have the date, so this is March 8, 2021, the time 3:09:50 p.m., and then it says UTC-5. What is that? The it's just to tell you that it's been adjusted, so the the normal information is captured um, in in UTC time minus zero. I mean, all time starts. And the point uh, in Greenwich, it used to be called Greenwich Mean Time GMT. Well, now it's UTC, uh, Universal, like whatever it means. 
Anyways, all time starts there. And depending on which way you go from that point on the globe is whether it's plus hours or minus hours. And we're five hours away from where all time starts. So let's go through this conversation. Blue from Jennifer, Ethan going to bowling. What's in green is James? Correct. What's the response there? IDK, or I don't know. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, what do you mean? I don't know. Um, and what was James' response? James says, I don't know, period. Exactly what I said, period. We'll know after he gets home. Okay. And Jennifer's response, 3.12 p.m., does he have his phone? Again, 3.12 p.m., why isn't he home yet? 3.12 p.m., he should be home by now. Correct. Okay. And... Jennifer at 3.12 p.m. and 56 seconds says freaking out. What was James' response? He does not get home till 3.16. Okay, so March 8, 2021, that was a weekday. From the combination of the digital evidence that you reviewed, location history, are you able to tell where James was when he was sending this message? Yes. Where's that? He was at home. Okay. And Jennifer's response, I told you to pick him up because he's upset. And I don't want him to do anything stupid, goddammit. Correct. That's March 8th at 3.13 p.m.? Correct. Okay, and James's response? Dude, period, chill, period, he is fine, period. And I'm trying to fucking work. Okay. So I'm going to move on to, again, March 8th, 3.13 p.m. What does Jennifer say? Jennifer replies with, does he have his phone? Question mark, question mark, question mark. And James' response? Yes, but he won't answer while he is walking. I will let you know the minute he walks in. Okay. And Jennifer at 3.14 p.m. says what? I'm seriously, serious freaking out. Then she says, is he home yet? And that was three minutes later. That's March, again, March 8th, 2021. That was a Monday. That was 3.17 p.m.? Yes, correct. Okay. I'm going to move on to... Exhibit 61, again, James and Jennifer Facebook messages. Blue will always be Jennifer, is that right? Correct, yes. Okay. March 19th, 9.37 a.m. Um, tell us what Jennifer writes, please. Jennifer writes, Ethan, awake. Okay, yes. James' response? Um, yeah. Jennifer? Replies with, how is he? And what does James say? James then says, he woke up. Looked like he had way, in all caps, too much to drink last night, complaining about a headache. That's March 19th, 2021, uh, 9.40 a.m. And what does Jennifer write? She replies with, well, he was really worked up and out of control, so I can see why. She continues on with, all I know is he needs to eat, go to work, work hard, and not complain. And he can get his stuff back. And that was at 9.41 a.m. Okay. And 10.15? Uh, Jennifer says, you respond, I didn't get a call. I didn't get it. Okay. And James' response? He responds back with, one text says, Jesus. Another one says, yes. Okay. He said, let me ask you a question. Why am I in your guy's room? LOL. And that was at March 19, 21, 10, 17 a.m.? Correct. And uh, Jennifer's response? OMG. Oh, my God. Uh, what did James write? James responds, I totally thought you were giving him a Xanax last night. Jennifer's response? She responded with, does he seem better? And then a second response, uh, no melatonin. Okay, and what did James say? He responds back with, I know. Jennifer's response at 10, 18 a.m., please. Jennifer said, but he hasn't had one before, should have only given him half. And what did James say? He is just doing his school, says his head hurts, he took so Tylenol. Okay, and Jennifer wrote, is he okay to work? Correct, she did. And then James, James responds back with, yeah. Okay. And what did Jennifer write at March 19th, 21, 11.38 a.m.? Does he remember what he did? And what did James say? James responds back with, dude, I am working on a demo right now. I have not talked to him, and he is doing school. Okay, Jennifer's response? She responds back with, okay then, jeesh. Now you've reviewed the entire phone seized from the shooter. Correct. Okay. 
Did one text message conversation stand out to you compared to the rest? Yes. Okay, and tell me why did it stand out? Just the volume of text messages back and forth, the amount that there was in just one chat. Okay, now without telling us the person with whom the shooter was was texting with that volume, um, can you tell us if you came to learn that the person he was texting was the same age? Yes, okay. he was. And he went to school with him? Correct. All right. Um, tell us about the approximate number of, of text messages between the shooter and his friend. There was over 20,000 text messages between the two from January to the middle end of October. Okay. So that sounds like a lot to me, but I'm not an expert in computer forensics. Give us an idea of what that, that scope is. 20,000. I mean, that printed is over 5,000 pages of text. Um, I've, I've examined phones that someone's entire chat conversation with everybody they have is less than 20,000. So it, it's just a, a large volume. To put it in comparison between, let's say, James and Jennifer's Facebook conversations, right? What's the scope and the difference in size there? I believe James and Jennifer was 10,000. 10,000 text messages back and forth okay. for that same time frame. So the same, same time frame, we have double the amount of text message communication between the shooter and his friend is James and Jennifer. Coming. Correct. Okay. You said January to October. Is that both 2021? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Thank you, Judge. Yes, 2021? Yes. No, there were also, without going into detail, video shared as well? Yes, there was. Okay. And were some of the content, the content of the conversation, the highly personal nature? Yes, it was. Now, in comparison to any other conversation on the shooter's phone, what's the difference in size between that particular text thread with everybody else's on the shooter's phone? He had he had over twenty thousand text messages with that with his one friend, and in comparison, there was between anybody else, there was a combined. I want to say less than a thousand between anybody else anybody else that you chatted with. So combined less than a thousand. Yes. And then that one friend was twenty over twenty thousand. Correct. Okay. Now I'm gonna show you just a very small portion of that. Uh, specifically April the fourth and April the fifth of two thousand twenty one, which would be right about two weeks after the messages that we just saw between James and Jennifer Crumbly. This has been admitted as exhibit sixty seven. Names are redacted obviously. Um, Green is the shooter? Correct. Okay. Uh, tell us what the shooter wrote April 4th, 2021, 1156 at night. He types, like I hear people talking to me and see someone in the distance and then he appears to try to correct the spelling of the word distance. Okay. And April 4th, 2021, 1156 in 50 seconds, what does he write? I actually asked my dad to take me to the doctor yesterday, but he just gave me some pills and told me to suck it up. And 11.57 p.m., what did he write? He continues on with, like it's at the point that I'm asking to go to the doctor. And then he says, my mom laughed when I told her. That was again 11.57 in the evening, April the 4th, 21? Correct. April 5th, 2021, this is just after midnight. What does he write? He tells his friend, but I'm having bad insomnia right now, RN, and paranoia. Okay. And then what does he write? I need help. That's at 12.11 a.m.? Correct. And then at 12, 12 a.m., was he right? I was thinking I calling 911, too, so I could go to the hospital. And continuing on, April 5th, 12, 12 a.m., what does he write? But then my parents would be really pissed. And finally, 12.38 a.m., what does he write? He says, I'm going to ask my parents to go to the doctors tomorrow or Tuesday again. And he continues with, but this time I'm going to tell them about the voices. And finally, he writes at 12.39 and 20 seconds, what? Like I am mentally and physically dying. Now, you discovered, we just mentioned, some videos on this text message thread between the shooter and that friend. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So I'm going to now direct you to August the 19th of 2021. First of all, did some of those images that he shared depict firearms? Yes, they did. Okay. So this is exhibit 70 and 71. 70 is the text message itself. What are we looking at here? That's uh, 
showing a video was sent to his friend. Okay. So this is the same friend we're referring to at all times? Correct, yes. Okay. yes. August 19, 2021, 9.31 p.m. And the video is 71. I'm going to play that now. Now that's August 19th, 2021. Um, do you know what, what he was handling in his hand? That was a handgun. This is Exhibit 72 and 73. They've both been admitted. This is 8.20 a.m. at 12.30 in the morning. So we're carrying over past midnight from the last video. Um, 72 is this text bubble. So what are we seeing here? Again, it's a text to his friend that he's been communicating with um, of another video of the gun. Okay. And this indicates that video was sent to his friend? Correct. All right. I'm going to play 73 now. Uh, sir, do we see a round in that chamber? Yes, there is. Okay. When I say round in the chamber, what does that mean? A, a bullet and a, and a shell. And that was August the 20th. Now, were you able to tell if the defendant or Jennifer Crumbly were actually inside the home when the video was taken? Yes. Okay. I'm going to go through. And we talked earlier about how you're able to find certain uh, location history. Correct. Okay. So, is it fair to say that you were able to do that for this specific date? That's correct, yes. So, this is Exhibit 74. Green, and so we're aware, green will always be James Crumbly's location. Purple will be Jennifer Crumbly. Okay. Um, what are we looking at here in Exhibit 74? Uh, that's a GPS location that was captured by Google. Uh, is, is the Gmail account, jamescrumbly8 at gmail.com, in the upper right corner, um, and on August 19th at 9.21 p.m. Okay, so that's that's on East Street. Did you come to learn that the Crumbly family lives at 112 East in Oxford? Yes, I did. Okay. So that indicates at least that his device is at the location approximately the time the first video on August 19th was taken. Correct. Okay. So this is Exhibit 75. This is purple again. So this would be Jennifer Grumbly. Correct. Tell us, please, what you see here. Uh, again, it's uh, using the same uh, Gmail account that they had. Uh, her GPS location from Google was at 9:29 p.m. on August 19th. Okay. And again, that's the first video that we saw. Correct. Okay. This is Exhibit 76, specifically August the 20th, 2021, 12:32 a.m. What do we see here? Again, another green circle indicating the location of. James's device. Okay. And this is approximately the same time the video of the loaded gun was sent. Correct. There's 77. What are we looking at here? That's the purple, which is Jennifer's, um, on August 20th, and that's at 12:21 a.m. Okay. Now this is Exhibit 72. This is part of that same conversation between the shooter and his friend. Yes. Okay. And this was August 20th, 21 at 12:32 a.m. Correct. Okay, so would that be right after that video was sent? That's correct. All right, what is the shooter write? My dad left it out, so I thought, why not? LOL. Okay. Now, during the course of your investigation, did you come to learn that this friend that the shooter was communicate, communicating with abruptly left the state of Michigan? Yes. Okay. And did you learn if that was done without notice to the shooter? Correct, it was not. Okay, what do you base that belief on? But, um, James had reached out to the father of uh, the shooter's friend, asking if everything was okay, and then the father of the friend told what, what was going on. I'm going to show you Exhibit 79. This is a text message from, you recovered off of James Crumley's phone? Correct. Okay, and again, names are redacted here. Did Correct. you come to learn that this is the father of the shooter's friend? Yes. Okay. And what's the date here? This is on October 30th, uh, 2021. Okay. And 9.52 p.m., what did he write? He wrote, hey, Mark, sorry for the late text. Hope the family is well. Just wanted to check in and make sure everything is okay with uh, the shooter's friend. Ethan has been trying to get a hold of him for a few days. Did not know if his phone was taken away, maybe, but just checking in. Ethan wanted to be with his friend for Halloween if he is okay. Okay. 
Now, we have this in the same conversation for context. This is October 30th, 21, 11.01 p.m. This was in response to that text? Correct. Okay. And what does he say? He says, hey, James, thanks for checking in on him. Unfortunately, it, his friend is in a bad place with the OC, OCD, unable to go to school most of the, this week. We are taking him out to Wisconsin tomorrow to put him in residential treatment. He'll be gone for 60 to 90 days. By far the hardest decision we've had to make. So he probably doesn't know how to approach it with Ethan or what to say. I think he is probably embarrassed about the situation and is the reason he is not answering. Let me talk to a friend. I, was, I wasn't aware that he wasn't talking to anyone. Okay. And then there was another text after? Yes. It, uh, he responds, sorry for the delayed response. Okay. And 10.30.21 and at 11.03 p.m.? The father of the friend says, let me talk to him and see how he wants to approach it with Ethan. Okay. And then what does James respond? James responds with, Mark, please let me know if there's any way at all we can help. He is a great kid and always great over here and very welcome at all times. Please let me know if we can help. So that's October 30th, 2021, 11, 10 p.m. Correct. Now, I want to talk to you moving to November of 2021. Did you find any information regarding James Crumbly's employment status? Yes. Okay. Um, and tell us with specifically specifically regarding November of 21, what did you find? That he had lost his job on the first of the month. Okay. And did he subsequently find another job? Yes, he did. And do you recall when that was? Uh... Shortly thereafter, I uh, started uh, door dashing. Okay. This is exhibit, oh, I'm sorry, we're still on page uh, exhibit 79. The response to James Crumley's text was what? Oh, he's, uh, the dad of the friend says, thank you, he loves you guys. Hopefully we can get him better, and Ethan can spend some time over here too. He has to voluntarily go, so there's a chance he may not be admitted. If you don't mind for now, if Ethan asks, tell him, he had to go out of town unexpectedly. If he gets admitted, then we can give him full disclosure. Is that all right? So here's exhibit 81. This is the, you mentioned he was door dashing? Correct. Okay. And you executed, well, you were part of the investigators who obtained information from DoorDash via search warrant? Yes. Okay. And the DoorDash, if you are a driver for DoorDash, you install an application on your phone? Correct. And did James Trembley have that on his phone? Yes, he did. Okay. Right and so what is this in 81? That's just from uh, one of the things that is pulled out when we extract data, pull data off the phone. It's installed applications, and it just tells us that that app was installed, the Dasher app was installed on his phone on November 9th. Okay. So that's when he would have put the application on the phone to start receiving orders to be a DoorDash driver. Correct. So this is November 9th, 2021, 835 p.m. Correct. All right. Uh, did you come to learn that he also received messages when he logged in and began picking up orders? Yes. Did you find any evidence to suggest that he worked anywhere else but DoorDash in the month of November of 2021? No, I did not. And based upon his location history and other information you obtained from his phone, did you come to learn if when he did work beforehand, he was away from the house or in the home? He was in the home. Now, what about... The shooter's digital footprint in the month of November 2021, after his friend left. When you reviewed the phone, the shooter's phone, for that month in particular, did you find any evidence of the shooter being in contact with anybody else, any other peer? No, he did not communicate with hardly anybody at all. Any evidence, either GPS pings, pictures, social media posts, text messages, anything to suggest that he met up with anybody outside of school? No. If I remember correctly, there was, for the whole month of November, there was only 48 total text messages from the 1st to the 30th. Okay. And what did those text messages, in, text messages include? Co a combined six of them were to James and Jennifer, and then the rest were, I remember seeing, he was accessing some app, maybe doing homework or something, trying to find, you know, it, it appeared like he would text it, maybe a math problem or something, it would send you the answer, I'm not entirely certain, but that's what it looked like. Okay. But no evidence of, of plans to meet with a friend outside of school or, no. or anything Objection, like that? Objection, I asked an answer. I don't think I asked that one. Keep going. Okay. 
Now, sir, um, when I talk about cached data, what does that term mean? Cache data is data that's stored in a temporary file for your device, whether it's a phone or a computer, to pull that information back up again quickly. Um, whether it's recently viewed or something you look at a lot, the computer can do it quicker because it knows it has to go to this one folder instead of re-downloading it. Okay, so so I understand it. Does that mean if, if it's... Does a phone, every phone have a certain area of storage of cache data? Yes, and every app, just if, depending on what the app is, it would have its own folder of cache data, yes. Okay. So if there's something, for example, an image in cache data, what does that indicate to you as a forensic examiner? It would imply that someone had to, it would have to have been on their phone, they would have to have seen it. Okay. Now, what does it mean if two people have the same cache data on their phone for an image? One either would have sent it to the other one or they randomly looked at the same picture. When examining the phone of the shooter and examining the phone of James Crumbly, did you find any images in common in cache data? Yes. Right. Now I want to specifically take you to see if it's 82 and 83. This is the extraction report and a screenshot. So first of all, 82 is the extraction report. This is a snippet of that, please. Tell, yes. me, tell me what that means. On 82? Yes. Uh, where the file info is and stuff? That, yes. That shows the, the name of the image when either, either you take a screenshot of something, it's going to name it real quickly, um, or if you receive it, it'll name it real quickly so it can track it within your, uh, your device. And then where it says path, that's the file path that, that often tells you what happened, how something got on a computer on a phone is by reading the file path. So let's talk about file path for a second. Now, anytime you, as a, an expert in computer forensics and cell phone forensics, you're looking to find how a piece of data got on the phone. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. And so how does the file path aid you in that? It just tells, that right there, it tells us what they, like this one, for example, on the screen. It says Android messaging. I know this was done using the Android messaging app. Okay, so this is from the shooter's phone, and the file path you said had Android messaging? Correct. At, um, at the, t the second line from the top... It says tar archive and then data slash and then com android messaging slash. Okay. Now, if something is found in cache data as opposed to just scrolling through the phone to find the image, what does that mean to you? That they would have seen it on their phone before. Okay. But why wouldn't you be able to find it just in messages? Probably if it was deleted. Okay. So this is on the shooter's phone, and we have... The, I guess the forensic fo footprint of this image. Correct. And the image itself in Exhibit 83. Correct. Okay, so what is the exhibit itself in 83? That tells you right there that's a screenshot because at the top of it, you can see the top part of your phone. Usually it has a time up there and uh, the battery life and the antenna strength that you have, and you can see it in the top of that image. Okay. So the screenshot here is 1239. Um, and we have the extraction report in 82 to verify. It's Monday, the 8th of November, 2021, 12.39 p.m. So that matches the screenshot? Correct, it does. And be because Exhibit 82 has the actual time and date stamp with the UTC minus 5 that matches the screenshot, what does that mean to you? That, that image, that's the image that was sent with that. Okay. And this is on the shooter's phone? Correct. All right, so this is... Um, well, this also has the file path here at 12.40 p.m. Tell me what we're looking at here. Uh, this one, so this file path is a little different. Um, again, starting where you see the word path on the screen there, and then going over, um, second line from under TAR archive, it's the uh, tct.cs.rcs. And the RCS tells me that that is um, rich content, and it's, that's Android's way of being able to either share large files to know... Um, a lot of people have an Apple phone. You can tell when someone's texting you back. That RCS feature allows Android phones to do the same thing. Okay. So as a forensic examiner, you can tell us that that screenshot was sent by the defendant's phone based upon, by the shooter's phone based upon the file path? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Now here's exhibits 85 and 86. This is from James Crumbly's phone. What are we looking at here? Uh, on the right side is, uh, I'm sorry, the left side, I apologize, is the extraction information uh, that was given, the name that was given in the file path. 
and then the screenshot again on the right side. Okay, Exhibit 85, the extraction report here. It has the date and time. It's November the 8th, 2021, but this is 1240 p.m., so that's later in time than what was found on the shooter's phone. Correct. Is that right? Correct. About one minute. But it's the same screenshot? Correct, it is. Now, did you find either screenshot of the 9mm, so price $299.99, use Smith & Wesson SD9VE in very good condition, comes with two 16-round magazines and cleaning kit with, with an image of a firearm, is that right? Correct. Okay, did you find that screenshot in either messaging from James Crumbly or the shooter? From James Crumbly? Yes. No. Okay. But did you find it anywhere else in the phone other than the cash deal? No, I did not. Okay. Have you seen reference to SD9VE 9mm elsewhere in this case? Yes. Where? In the shooter's journal. Okay. And again, because it's found in cash data and nowhere else, what does that mean to you? That it would have had it one time been on the phone. It, the, as you're opening the text message, your phone's going to say, i got to save that image so I can look at it if they want to open it up. So the fact that it's in the cash data tells me that they had opened it up. Okay. To see it. Now, is it possible to recover deleted content from a phone? Potentially. Tell me why. Each Android phones are different. So depending on the manufacturer of the phone, whether you have either a high-end phone or a simple throwaway phone that you buy at Walmart, um, the Android operating system can be changed to suit the manufacturer's or the reseller's specifications. So if you want to sell a cheaper end phone that doesn't have all the functionalities of a higher end phone, usually doesn't have the features to be able to store longer content or retrieve deleted content. Okay. So it's nothing to do with your forensic tools per se, it's just on the manufacturer? Correct. Is it more likely to recover deleted messages after both users delete the message? No. It's, no. Is it more difficult? Yeah. Correct. Yes. Okay. So the fact that this was found in cache data and nowhere else, that's significant to you? Yes. Why? That it was, it was on the phone at one time and now it's not there. Did all the Crumblies have Androids? Yes, they did. I'm going to direct your attention now to the days before the shooting. We'll start with November the 26th of 2021. Now, sir, given the, the tools available at your disposal and the information you're able to pull from, um, I'm going to ask you to, to build as best you can a digital footprint of the crumblies from the 26th to the 30th. Okay. Now, are you familiar with the, the firearm purchase of the 6 hour 9 millimeter on November the 26th, 2021? Yes. Now, based upon data locations and other information that you were able to retrieve in your investigation, are you able to tell us approximately when that purchase occurred? Yes. When? It was between 1 and 2 p.m. Okay, well, I'm going to show you Exhibit 87 here. This is data location from 12.08 p.m. on 11.26.21. So what are we looking at right here? That, uh, I apologize. It was between 12 and 1 p.m. They were at the gun range there, or the gun store there. Okay. So this location here verifies that James Crumley's device was at that, that firearm store with the six-hour purchase that day? Correct. Yes. Okay. And this is Exhibit 88. This is 12.57 uh, p.m. And we can see East Street as far as where we're oriented towards the map. What are we looking at here? That shows uh, James Crumley's location relative to his house at 112 East Street. Okay. So what can you surmise from, from these data points? That This one in particular, the larger the circle is, the more, um, I don't want to say less accurate, the, the larger the range where the device could be. This one in particular is 62 meters from that point. So he could be anywhere within 62 meters of that point there near his house. Okay. So because we have a, a more narrow point, we did it 87, we can be reasonably assured that the device was at the firearm store from 1208, and then at 1257, he was getting within 62 meters of his house? Correct. Okay. Now, to the extent possible, I'd like us to go through what the Kremlin family did after the purchase of that firearm on November 26th. <clears throat> Tell us what you saw on their phones, what they did after the gun was purchased. They went uh, Christmas tree shopping. There are pictures of it. Sir, when, when someone takes a picture of something, 
Is there a way to tell where and when that picture was taken? Usually, yes. Tell me why. Uh, so a picture that you take with your phone or even a, a camera that you might have, a Canon camera, um, captures what's called metadata. You usually tell your phone to do it. And metadata is data within data. It's, so the, the main information here that you see on the screen is uh, of a map. Well, embedded in that could be how that map was made by the camera that took the picture, maybe the computer that took the picture, how they, even the screenshot was made. That's information that you don't see. That's the metadata. So we're looking at exhibits 89 and 90 here. So 89 is the metadata, 90 is the photograph itself. Tell us what we're looking at here. That's uh, it was taken from the shooter's phone and he's holding a handgun that was purchased on the 26th. And the handgun on the... the, the uh, the grip there is a six hour? Correct, it is. Okay. And so when and where was this picture taken? This was taken at the Crumbly home on uh, November 26th. And what time? At 1.03 p.m. Okay. So we saw from the, the location history that, that James Crumbly was almost at his house at 12.57 p.m. And this photograph was taken six minutes later? Correct. Now, the, did the shooter post anything on Instagram with regards to this firearm? Uh, he posted pictures of, the, of him holding the gun and then um, talking, telling people to ask questions, they'll answer. So here's Exhibit 95. What do we see here? That's the Instagram post where the shooter wrote, Just got my new beauty today, hard eye emoji, six hour, nine millimeter. Ask questions, I will answer. And when was this uh, post made? Uh, in the bottom left corner, you can see it was no November 26th, 2021. And it says 18.06, which is 6.06 uh, UTC. And that's what I was talking about. We're minus five or four hours. So at, in November, we're minus five hours. So it's taken at 3.06. All right. Here is also exhibit 95. What do we see here? 106. I apologize. It was 106 that was taken. 106. I, minus I was going to correct your math, but. Yes, I apologize. Um, another picture of him holding it in his hand. Um, and that one was taken shortly after at 1.06 uh, uh, p.m. Okay, so same caption of the post, different photograph? Correct. All right. And here is, uh, again, same, same time, same caption? Yes, just looking down the sights of the gun. Okay. We see three dots at the top of the fire. What is that? Those are the sights of the gun. The two, uh, the two on, the, on the outside um, in the front post, if you don't know, um, you line those up. It's called your sight picture. You get those three dots in a line. If you have equal light on either side, it's where your round's going to go. And he's just practicing lining up the sights. Okay. And that's lined up in a way where it would fire the way you would want it to. That'd be right? It's put around right below it, yeah. Okay. And same, same caption, just got my new beauty today. Six hour and a
posted? That was at 19.02 or 2.02 p.m. Okay. And that's November 27th, 21, correct? Correct. Now, uh, this is Exhibit 101. This is Jennifer Crumley's Instagram post. What do you see here? Uh, she posted the target that she had shot and posted with it, Mom and Sunday oh. testing out his new Xmas present. My first time shooting a 9mm, I hit the bullseye. Okay. So that is how close in time in relation to what her son posted? Within one minute. Now this is another photograph here, same post? Yes. Same time? Yes, it is. Okay. And finally, what do we see here? That's the Sig Sauer handgun right there with the magazines and the pamphlet. So because all three indicate Mom and Sunday testing out his new Xmas present, my first time shooting a 9mm, I hit the bullseye. Does that indicate those three pictures were posted together? Yes, they were. Well, here's exhibit 102 here. This is at this is 2 or 3 p.m. What do we see here? This is uh, Jennifer uh, at her house at 927 at 2 or 3 p.m. Okay, and so that's practically the same time those photographs, those posts were, were um, those images were posted? Correct. Okay. So the fact that they were posted on her device or her social media accounts through her device and we have a device location here, what does that mean to you? That she was at her house when she made that post. Okay. And were you able to tell if James Crumbly saw these images? Yes. Here's Exhibit 103. What are we looking at here? This is um, extra data information from the cell phone extraction. And again, back to the file path that I talked about, you can see the third line down in the second column. You see um, com.facebook.katana slash cache, showing, indicating that it's in the cache folder. Okay. So like the, the screenshot of a... Uh, Smith and Wesson 9mm sent by his son to him. These images were also found in the cache folder? Correct. Now, we will obtain, obtain data locations from James Crumbly's Gmail account for November the 27th, 2021. Yes. Okay, and that helped you identify what he, where he was that day? Yes. Okay. So I'll go through exhibits 104 through 107. Here's 104. Um, what do we see here? Uh, it shows James' location. Uh, it's near the gas station of the Meyer uh, uh, at Ray Road in 24. Okay, and we already talked about at this point in time he was working for DoorDash. Correct. And um, we, always, we already identified the fact that when there was an order ready, he would receive a text message from the DoorDash app? Correct. Okay, so were you able to tell what he was doing that day? He, yes. What was he doing? He was door dashing. Okay. So 9.37 a.m. indicates one position where he's at, and looks like he's back home at 5.32 p.m.? Correct. And here's exhibit 106. It's about 6.03 p.m. He's out of the house then? Correct. Okay. And 6.33 back home? Correct. Now what about Jennifer's locations from that day? Were you able to obtain any idea where she was that day? Yes. Okay. This is Exhibit 108. What do we see here? Uh, it's the purple dots indicating Jennifer's locations. Okay. So we have um, 2.29 p.m. to 3.32 p.m. and locations outside of the home that would indicate what to you? She was at home. She was at, out and about. Okay. Just to make sure I'm clear, on the 27th, we see James currently leaving home about 9.37 a.m., returning at 5.32 p.m., Leaving again at 6.03 p.m., home again at 6.33 p.m. Correct. And the same day, Jennifer's gone from about 2.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Correct. Now, Sunday, November the 28th. This is Exhibit 109. Tell us what we're looking at here. That is a GPS location for Jennifer on uh, November 28th at 12 p.m. So she's obviously away from her home. Uh, do you know what's at this location? Yeah, that's where the horse farm is. Okay. Now, you say horse farm, you went through all of the digital evidence in this case? Correct. Okay, including the Facebook messages between James and Jennifer? Correct. And messages from James to anyone else or Jennifer to anybody else? Correct. Okay. Um, are you aware of 
James and Jennifer spending time at the horse farm. Yes, sir. Okay, and tell me how you're aware of that. Your Honor, I'm going to object to relevance. We addressed this, Judge. You addressed it in your earlier um, opinion as well. I, I, think, I think we did. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not allowed. I think your objection was to wait and not in this Thank you, Judge. Do you, how are you able to, to know that, Judge? By how many times they talked about whether I'm going to the barn to do this or work on that this horse or take care of that horse, yes. Okay. Um, give us an idea of how many times they were talking about it. They talked, it was mentioned within their chats 86 times of going to the barn. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, what that was from January to November. From that conversation, were you able to tell if they would go together or if they had a plan to do Both. They would go take care of one go, go take care of a horse or they'd meet up there together. Okay. Here is exhibit 110. This is Sunday the 28th at 2.07 p.m. This is at the Crumbly Family Home. Correct. Okay. So these last two pieces of the exhibit indicate that Jennifer Crumbly was at the horse barn from approximately noon to whenever she left arriving home at 207. Correct. Okay. And that's the Sunday after that fire on the 9 millimeters purchase. Correct. Now let's talk about James' data location points. Here's exhibit 111. Uh, what do we have here? Uh, it shows his location near the, at the Meyer gas station again. Okay, and tell us what he was doing that day from your review of the digital evidence. That day he was uh, door dashing again. So this is a data point at one, I'm sorry, 8.56 a.m. Exhibit 112 is 12.45 p.m. Here's he's back at the house? Correct. Does he leave again? Yes, he does. Okay, here's 113. Exhibit 113 at 12.52 p.m. What do we see here? It shows him going away from the house. Okay, and exhibit 114, what do we have here? Uh, at 5.13 p.m., he's back at the house. Okay. So all this tells you that James left at 8.56 a.m., returned at 12.45 p.m. He left again seven minutes later and returned 5.33 p.m. That's correct. Okay. Now we're we'll going to move on to Monday, the next day, Monday, November the 29th. I'm going to talk about a Facebook conversation between James and Jennifer Crumbly from that day. So this is Exhibit 115. Um, Jennifer Crumbly at 8.23 a.m. on Monday, November the 29th, are you at the barn? And then follow up with just a question mark at 9.02 a.m. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So again, blue is Jennifer, <coughs> green would be James. James. Yes, sir. Okay. When you mentioned like those, those 86 times you talked about the barn, is this what you were referring to? Yes, it was. Okay. Was this a portion of what you were referring to? Correct. James' response was what at 9.05 a.m.? Uh, working on Billy. Okay. And did you come, who's Billy? Did you? I come to find, it was one of the horses. All right. Uh, this is also part of 115. What did James send to Jennifer? He sent a photo, it's uh, the horse's legs. Okay. And Jennifer's response? Do the fronts too. So that's 9.21 a.m. on Monday, November the 29th. Um, what did Jennifer write to James after that? She asked him, did you call the vet yet? And then tells him, make sure you get back in between his heel bulbs. And James' response was, I did at 9.34, then fronts two right after? Correct. And James wrote what at 9.35? He says, what exactly should I tell the vet? Type out for me, leaving the barn now. Okay. And Jennifer's response was what? Billy looks to have scratches slash mud fever. He's starting to stock up on all fours and concerned about infection. He's not lame. Sensitive to the touch, and they go down when he moves. Is there an antibiotic I can get him on? We just put desitin and antibacterial on his legs today. Okay, and then she wrote what? She asked, was he stocked up this morning? Okay, so that was 9.41 a.m.? Correct. And James' response at 9.43? He responds back with, he was stocked up more in the back than in the front. In fact, the front didn't really look stocked up at all, so I launched them for a few minutes before. I put the stuff on it, and it took the swelling down a little bit, but I got that cream all over, you know, in between his heel bulbs and stuff like that. I'll call a vet here in a minute. Okay, and then you wrote, talk to text, FYI, so I have no idea what I really just said. Yes. Jennifer, it made sense, LOL, at 958, and then James' response at 959? James responds with, I just talked to the vet, Carrie. Say she's going to talk to the vet once one of them get back in, and she will give me a call back. I explained everything exactly how you wrote. 
it down. Good thing you wrote it down like that, LOL, for me. Okay. And her response was, okay, good, LOL? Correct. Okay, so this conversation regarding the barn and the vet started at 8.23 a.m. and it went until 10.15 a.m. Correct. Okay. Did you come to learn if a um, message was left for Jennifer Crumbly while this conversation was going on between James and Jennifer? Yes, there was. This is Exhibit 116. Ms. Williams, do we have the volume? Hi, Ms. Crumbly. My name is Pam Fine. I'm calling from Oxford High School, and I'm here with Mr. Hopkins, who's Ethan's counselor. I was just calling to let you know that we just spoke with Ethan and had a really nice conversation. Um, one of his teachers had sent an email to the office just that she was concerned because um, Ethan, when she was walking around the room checking assignments, that he was on his phone looking at bullets um, and that sort of thing. So she just wanted us to have a conversation. We did. He said he had been to the shooting range with you this weekend, and we were like, yep, you know, uh, you know, guns are a hobby for a lot of people, and shooting ranges, and that's perfectly normal, um, and that we just wanted to make sure I uh, had a conversation with him about the things he searches at school, um, and things versus searching, searching at home, like Mr. Hopkins gave a good example of like if a teacher makes beer um, at home, perfectly normal and healthy, but can't be using searches for making beer at school. So we had a conversation, he was, he was great, um, he's like, yep, I get it. So I just wanted to let you know that we did have that conversation with him, and um, I don't know, about five minutes, and he went back to class. All right, if you have any questions, you can give me a call. Otherwise, um, I hope you have a great holiday. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, so that was November the 29th, 2021. Did you find evidence that Jennifer Crumley accessed that voicemail? Yes, she did. Is that depicted here in People's Exhibit 117? Yes. All right. Um, could you find from the messages between James and Jennifer who picked their son up from school that day? Uh, Ethan did. I, I apologize. James did. Father. Here's Exhibit 120. Um, this is Jennifer Crumley, you still working, 2.44 p.m. Um, James says no, waiting for their son. Two correct. Okay. And 119, this is later on. What does Jennifer write to James? She asks you, did Ethan tell you what happened today? Okay. And that's, that's the same afternoon that the voicemail was left? Correct. Okay. And James's response? Was yeah. Now we're going to move on to... November the 30th. And we'll go step by step from what you were able to discern from all of the evidence that you had to review your disposal. So, in the morning, November 30th, were you able to tell what time the shooter was dropped off at school? Uh, after 7 30 p.m. or a.m. So, were you able to pull a surveillance video for this? Yes. This is Exhibit 122. 7.46 a.m. on the 30th? Correct. <clears throat> Tell us when you recognize him, please. He's getting, he got out of the car a second ago. He's a Last one walking up. Right there? Yes. And he was dropped off by his father? Correct. Okay. Exhibit 123, tell us where James Crumley went after that. Uh, at 8.04 a.m. he was at home. Okay. And then one, Exhibit 124, where was he? At the horse farm again. Okay, so 9 4 a.m. So 7.46 a.m. he dropped off his son. He was home at 8.04 a.m. He's at the horse barn by 9.04? Correct. Okay. Do you know what time that Jennifer Crumley got to work? About the same time, 9.04. So this is what we're looking at here? That's Jennifer walking into her place of employment. This is Exhibit 125? Yes. Okay. And this is November 30, 2021 at 9.04 a.m.? Correct. 
Now, do you know if she received a phone call shortly after arriving? Yes, yeah, she did. So, you did a 126. What do we have here? That's a from the call log obtained from her phone um, from the school. Okay, so we have a missed call at 9.24 a.m. on November the 30th? Correct. And then we have a return call at what time? 9.27 a.m. And how long is that phone call? That's five minutes, almost six minutes. So is that 5.43, is five minutes and 43 seconds? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, next in the timeline, 9.31 a.m., what are we looking at here? That's a um, the screenshot or a picture of the of a math homework, math sheet homework that the shooter had. Okay. So this was sent to whom? To Jennifer. To Jennifer Crumbly? Yes. Okay. Exhibit 128, what's this? That's the full size image of it, of the math sheet. So did you come to learn there were actually two different math worksheets? Yes. Okay. And this would be referred to as the altered one? Correct, it is. So this was sent to Jennifer Crumbly at 931? Correct. All right, that's Exhibit 128. Exhibit 129 is what? That is appears to be an email of uh, the math worksheet. Here's Exhibit 30. This is what contained in the email? Yes, that's the original. So this, is, this was emailed to Jennifer Crumbly at um, 9.32 a.m., is that right? Correct. And the scratched out version was texted to her at 9.31 a.m.? Correct. Okay. Now this is Exhibit 131. This is at 9.33 a.m., so this is one minute after that original drawing was sent to Jennifer Crumbly. What are we looking at? Uh, Jennifer telling James, call now, emergency. Okay. And, and then she says again, emergency, uh, two minutes later. And then at 9.38 a.m., what does she send? She sends the picture, the two pictures of the math worksheet. Okay. So the one that's scratched out in, in the original, the Correct. both that were sent to Jennifer? Yes. Okay. And James's response at 9.44 a.m.? James responds with, my God, WTF. And then what? Uh, vet not here yet. It's McElmurray for Kira's horse, still waiting on vet. Okay. So we saw earlier that his location indicated that he was at the barn by at least 9.04 a.m.? Correct. Okay. And this was at 9.45 a.m.? Correct. And what did Jennifer write? Uh, Responds back with, he said he was distraught about last night. James? He said, James says, we talked about it this morning. Then he asked, you talk to him, question mark. And what did Jennifer respond? Responds with, can you call? That's 9.57 a.m.? Correct. Okay. And what does Jennifer write at 10.04 a.m.? She says, heading to a school, I'm very concerned. And that's at 10.04 a.m. on November the 30th, 2021. Correct. Now, did you learn that they both arrived at Oxford High School? Yes, they did. Okay. And did you learn approximately the time they arrived there? Yes. What time is that? It's about 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. This is Exhibit 132, 9.36 a.m. We see James' location history that's still at the barn? Correct. Okay. And 134, this is the same surveillance uh, footage that we saw Jennifer Crumley arriving at work at 9.04 a.m. This is at 10.06 a.m.? Correct. Okay. And this is consistent with what we just saw in those Facebook messages when she wrote heading to school? Correct. Okay. This is Exhibit 126. What do we see here? It's a call to the school, to the counselor from Jennifer. Okay, so she left at 10.04, and then at 10.07, she called the same counselor who called her? Correct. And exhibit 131, headed to a school at 10.12. So that Correct. would be the timeline for that period of the day. Correct. Okay. So do we have an idea of, you said about after 10.30 a.m. that meeting occurred? Correct. Okay, and so is this what you base that opinion on? Correct, yes. All right, so what do we see here at Exhibit 135? Well, you see at the top of it is the horse barn, and then he takes a path down Gardner Road, and then uh, heads to the high school. Okay. So, if I'm correct from what we just saw, the Jennifer arrived at work, well, first of all, the shooter was dropped off at school at, at 7.46 a.m. by his father. Correct. He went to the horse barn at 9.04. Correct. 
Jennifer arrived at her place of employment about the same time, 9 4? Yes, sir. Okay. And she received the phone call at 9 24. Correct. Then you saw the messages sent from her counselor and the phone call from her, her counselor and the messages thereafter with those two drawings? Yes, sir. And then the Facebook messages at, um, directly after to James with, with those two drawings? Correct. Okay. And this shows when he left the horse barn and about the time he arrived at Oxford High School? Correct. And did he, did he stop by his house before he went to the meeting? No. Did Jennifer stop by the house before they went, she went to the meeting? No, sir. Did they go in one car or separate cars? They were in separate cars. Okay. Now, we had discussed this particular aspect of the case in a separate hearing um, some time ago, and there was an original belief that they arrived in one car. Correct. Okay, you, you came to learn that they arrived in two different cars. Objection That's correct. Our leading. Again, it's just, just foundation, sir. Tell me what happened. When I originally was watching the video, the system that the school has, it doesn't, it's not continually recording. It only records when there's enough movement in the frame. So if someone, if, if they're too far of a distance away, it's not going to record, even though there might be somebody walking across the parking lot. The sensors don't pick it up. And it didn't, once I saw the second car, what I th thought was the first car, pull into a parking spot, the next thing I saw was just two people standing in front of it. So I assumed that they had come out of that car together. So keeping with our, our timeline here, 10.29 a.m., um, we have a call log of what we see here. Uh, James calling Jennifer. Okay, and how long was that phone call? Seven minutes and 16 seconds. Okay. And based upon what you found on the video and the messages and the other locations, this is before they arrived at school? Yes. Okay. Now you were able to um, pull the surveillance footage of both vehicles arriving and their movements while inside the Oxford High School, at least that were contained on surveillance video, is that right? Correct. Okay, so this is Exhibit 137. I'm going to play this, and just so we know, at the bottom of the screen here, we have a description of the camera, what it's looking at with the time. Correct. So this is 10.36 a.m. on November, November the 30th, 2021? Correct. Okay. And this, what are we looking at right here? That's the parking lot of the school on the north side of the school. Sir, whatever you're able to, give us some context of what we're looking at. I come to find out that that's Jennifer pulling up right there in that car. Okay. And then there's James and Jennifer walking up to the school. Right here? Yes. Sir, this is James Jennifer Crumbly in the Oxford High School, I think? Yes, okay. that's in the office there, and they're being directed around to counseling. At the bottom of the screen there, it's 10.39 a.m.? Correct. So it just might actually be a good time for a short break if the court was inclined to take one. Just fine, Your Honor. All right, so um, I'm going to let you sit down, but you can't discuss your testimony. Then. All right, so just about a 10 minute break. Okay. All right, to the
use. Right, so I agree with that. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Grant.
I remember. Thank you. Calling people versus James Grumbly, case number 222799FH. Thank you. Okay, so we were on November the 30th, 2021. This is at 10.39 in the morning. You identified both James and Jennifer Crumbly in Oxford High School. Correct. Okay. So this was a surveillance video pulled from that day and that time? That's correct. Okay. Clock there that says 12:42. That's incorrect. Correct. It never changes. Okay. Correct. So the actual time is in the yellow at the bottom of the video. It just turned 10:40 in the morning. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Did you come to learn who this person was that greeted James and Never Crumbly? Yes, yeah, school counselor. Okay. That's, I just skipped now from 10.41 to 10.52 a.m. Same view, same exhibit. Who do we see leaving the office? That's the shooter. And that's 10.52 a.m.? Correct. This is 10.53 a.m. Who do we see? It's James and Jennifer Crumbly leaving. Okay. This is James and Jennifer Crumbly? Yes. And they're walking out of the counselor's office? Correct. Back towards the front office. Now, at one point in time, James Crumbly was holding a white piece of paper now it appears Jennifer Crumley is holding that. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. And he just took it back from her? Correct, he did. So they leave the building at 10.54 a.m. on November 30th. Correct.
this is 10.57 in the morning? Correct. Okay. And let me know when you see James Crumley's vehicle leaving. Here it starts right there. Okay. It turns to its left. Okay, did James Crumbly stop by his house after that meeting? No, he did not. I'm going to move on to, we'll go to exhibit 140. This is a location data at 11 a.m. Where at? At uh, Meyer. Okay. And that's November 30th, 11 a.m., and that Meyer is where? To the west of the school, just down the street. Is that the Meyer you told us about earlier yes, it today? Is. Okay, that's so it. that's the Meyer you went to on that same day? Correct, yes. Okay. And um, do you know what he does there? Um... I know he sits there for a while, for a little bit. I think he starts door dashing. Did he log on to door dash yet at that point? Yes. Okay. Here's 141. This is 1124 AM. And this is the same surveillance footage of Jennifer Crumley's employer? Correct. Coming back to work. So she's back to work at 1124 AM. Correct. Okay. So this is exhibit 142. I'm going to go to a Zoom version here. This is November the 30th. This is the DoorDash search warrant return? Correct. Okay, so Part you can... I'm sorry? Part of it, I'm sorry, yes. Okay. And so this is just depicting the November the 30th date. November Correct, the 30th yes. Days. Okay. And so he logged on to DoorDash at what time? 11. Okay, so that's the time he actually logged on. Correct. Correct? Okay. So going back to this version on Exhibit 142, there are no logons prior to 11 a.m. that day. That's correct. Okay. All right. And in fact, we see his first um, message was 11 a.m.? Correct. All right. That's Exhibit 80. Exhibit 143. Now, the time here at the, the top corner, that's 11 a.m. to 11.19 a.m. And this is a map that's been created that depicts DoorDash pickups. Is that right? Correct. Pickup and delivery? The route he took, yes. Okay. And if you would refer back to that DoorDash search warrant return, Exhibit 142, you were able to tell that he had four different orders that morning until the shooting? That's correct. Okay. So this location history depicts what? That, again, that's the path from um, the Google search warrant return we used to follow the path down to where he picked it up to where he dropped it off. Okay. And at any point, did he stop by his house? No, he did not. This is 11:19. Um, That's when he got his second delivery. Correct. Okay. And exhibit 44, 11:19 to 11:46. What do you see here? It shows where his last, his first drop off was to where the second pickup was. Okay. And then where he dropped it off. Did he stop by his house then? No, he did not. Next door dash order is 11:58 a.m. Correct. Exhibit 145 here, this is the, the GPS locations? Yes, it is. From Google, what we, yes. What do we see here? Uh, his second drop-off in the south, the bottom part of the picture to where he went back up to the mire at the top side of the picture and dropped it off. Did he ever stop by his house? No, he did not. This is 12.51 for a door dash order, November the 30th. 1251, that's what you told us was when the shooting started. Yes. Exhibit 146, what do we see? Where his uh, third drop-off was at the bottom of the picture and the pickup end um, of the fourth trip to the drop-off of the fourth trip. Okay. Did he ever stop by his house? No, he did not. Now, what's the first relevant event in either James or Jennifer's devices after the shooting occurred at 1251? Uh, an email was sent out. Okay, this is Exhibit 141, or a portion of it. This is what? That's uh, the email header from um, the Oxford Community Schools at uh, 109 p.m. Your Honor, I believe this is Exhibit 147. Oh, what did I say? I'm sorry. Yeah, like 147. Thank you, 147. So this email was found from a search warrant return on James Crumley's email? Correct. Okay. And it was sent from Oxford Community Schools to James underscore Crumley at yahoo.com? That's correct. Subject line was active emergency at OHS? Correct. Okay. And this was at 109 and 52 seconds in the afternoon? Correct. Okay. 
Now, are we able to tell from his data locations where he was when he received the email? He was um, at he was going to the Meyer, yes. Okay, so this is 1.11 p.m., so 1.11.38 seconds, about a minute and a half later, his GPS pinged at that same Meyer that you went to? Correct. Okay. That's exhibit 148. Now, after that email was received at about 1.09, 1 1.10 p.m., who did he call? He called Ethan. Okay. He called the shooter? Yes, the shooter. And that was at 1.13 p.m.? Correct. And at 1.17 p.m., he tried to call him again? Correct, he did. Okay. Now their phone call went through, is that right? That's correct. That's exhibit 136. Does he leave the my parking lot? No, uh, he does for a little bit, yes. Okay. So at 1.17 p.m., we see a lot of different green dots here. Is this the first data location that shows that he left the Meyer parking yes, lot? Yes, it is. So that was after he received the email and after he called the son twice? Correct. Okay. That's exhibit 149. And does he call anybody else at that point in time? What yes, he tries calling Jennifer. Okay. That's exhibit 136. And do we know Jennifer left her work that day? That's correct, she did. Okay. I'm just going to show a clip. Clip here, this is exhibit 150 at 1 18 p.m. So this is after he had that 57 second phone call with Jennifer. Correct. Okay, we saw that James left the Meyer parking lot at 1 17. Did he go home then? Yes, he did. Now, first, did he call, did he receive a phone call from Jennifer? Yes, he did. Okay, so this is 1.19 p.m., and how long is this phone call? 10 minutes and 19 seconds. Okay. Exhibit 151 is GPS location from 1.20 in the afternoon, November the 30th? Correct. Okay, so that's right after he received that phone call from Jennifer Crumbly? That's correct. Okay, and that's, this indicates that he was at the home? On East Street, yes. Now, at this time, do we know if Jennifer was on the move? Yes, she was. Okay. But she wasn't home yet. She wasn't home yet? No, she was not. All right. So this is exhibit 152. Where is she at, at uh, from 118 to 120 p.m.? Uh, that's her employer. She uh, at Square Lake and Telegraph. It's here. Okay. Now, while she was on that phone call with the defendant, with James Crumbly, did she send any text messages? Yes, she did. This is Exhibit 133. What did Jennifer Crumbly write to Andrew Smith? Well, first of all, did you learn who Andrew Smith was? Yes, I did. And who's that? That was her boss at work. So this is at 1.23 p.m. According to the records that you reviewed, was she still on the phone with James Crumbly? Yes, she was. What did she write her boss? She said, the gun is gone and so are the bullets. He replies with, I'm praying everything is okay. She says... OMG, oh my God, Andy, he's going to kill himself. He must be the shooter. Okay. And that was 1.23 in the afternoon on November 30th. Correct. Now, did the defendant receive another phone call from his wife after they hung up from that 10-minute phone call? Yes. Okay. Going back to the phone log, this is at 1.30 in the afternoon. It looks like a three-minute phone call between the two. Correct. Now this was at 1.30 p.m. with a three-minute phone call, so it lasted about 1.33 in the afternoon. Correct. What did James Crumley do after he hung up with his wife? He called 911. This is Exhibit 154.
great home to, to, to find out. Okay. And I think my son took the gun. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I'm what really freaking out. My son's name is Ethan Crumbly. C-R-U-M-B-L-E-Y. Sheriff's Office, Oxford Substation? That's correct, they did. Okay. This is Exhibits 155 and then 156. These are location points. 1.58 p.m. for James Crumbly. Where is he at? That's the actual the location of the substation. Okay. So he made the phone call from his house at 134, and he's at the police station at 158? Correct. All right. And this is Jennifer Crumbly. She was there at 159? Correct. <clears throat> now, sir, we talked in the beginning of your testimony about... Um, the multiple phones that were recovered and that you conducted an analysis on. You have a chance to review the forensic downloads of the um, other phones as well? Yes. Okay. Now, during the course of your forensic in investigation, did you find that on a phone associated with Jennifer Crumbly, what we refer to as her burner phone, had an alarm set for December the 4th, 2021? Correct. It, it was. Okay. That's 157. Oh, they're back home at one at 2.30 in the afternoon at 157. Exhibit 157, is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay, so Jennifer Crumbly, 2.30, James Crumbly, 2.30 afternoon. Correct. Okay, so now, now moving ahead to December the 4th. This is Exhibits 159 and 160. What are we looking at here? That's the screenshot um, on the left side and then the, showing the alarm set on the right side. Okay. Now, from your review of all of the forensic evidence that you had, did it appear that Jennifer Crumbly would leave her phones on throughout the night? That's correct. She would. Okay. Now, we talked a little bit about how the cash <clears throat> images were found of the 9 millimeter handgun, but the message wasn't found, and how you have an ability to occasionally obtain deleted content. That's correct. All right. Um, were you able to obtain a Facebook thread between Jennifer Crumbly and somebody named Brian Walsh? Yes, that's correct. Were you able to obtain any particular messages that were deleted? Yes. I'm going to show you Exhibit 161 and 162. These have been admitted. 161, what are we looking at here? Uh, the first box indicates that uh, the message was unsent. Uh, and the second one... Um, from Jennifer Crumley is, we're on the run again, helicopters not sure where to uh, message you on December 2nd at 1.31. When you say unsent, why is this significant to you? It says she recalled the message back. And this is from a uh, Facebook message? Yes. Okay, so this is after the shooting. This is Thursday, December the 2nd, 2021, and she wrote, we're on the run again, helicopters not sure where I'll message you. Correct. Exhibit 162, later on Thursday, December the 2nd, 2021, did you find another deleted message? Uh, yes. And tell us what that is, please. Uh, the original message was, we're fucked, and then that was also unsent. Okay. And because it says, you unsent a message in the red X, <laughs> does that indicate to you that it was deleted? Correct. 
Now, sir, you reviewed all of the defendant's phone call history. Is that correct? Correct. At any point from the time that James Crumley left for that piece of paper on November the 30th, 2021, to the time the shooting occurred, at any point in time did he call any doctor, hospital, or medical provider? There was no indication of that, no. Now, you reviewed his entire web history as well, James Crumley. Right. At any point did you see him researching 9mm handguns? No. So the screenshot that was on his phone that was deleted, that was sent from his son to him on November the 8th. That's correct. <clears throat> now, earlier, you described the video that you put together of the shooting. Yes. And you spent, I asked you earlier, and I think your response was two minutes as far as hours. Could you, for context, though, to lay a foundation for the jury, could you give us an idea of how much time you actually devoted to this? To that particular video? Yes. Oh, I would... Your Honor, I'm going to object 40 to, to 50 relevance. hours. I'm sorry, I'm going to object to relevance. Just, the jury's going to see the actual video in a few days. This witness was the, the individual to put over 100 camera angles together. To do that, he had to, to watch an awful lot of footage and he also had to, to, to parse out certain activities of students before, during, and after the shooting. The video itself is synced together. There's portions where it skips, and we have to explain why. There's no sound in the video. Okay, okay, well, you can, you can ask him that then. You can definitely ask him that. Why? It's, it's not one complete video going from beginning to end. No, it's not. The series of different camera angles. Okay, okay. Okay. So it's it follows the shooter's movements uh, from the different cameras, correct? Okay, but you also had to aid in the identification of the victims. Yes, I did. Okay, but how how did how is it that you did that? Uh, by where they were standing. Yeah, I'm going to object to this as well. I don't know how this is relevant either. So this is a this is a homicide case. Well, it is a homicide case. I'm not wrong. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, by where they were standing, um, I was asked. What, how, what they were doing just prior to the shooting, the victims were. So how are you to put that together, though? I don't understand what you mean. How is it that you used that information to help identify the other investigators who was who? Did you, let me ask you, did you learn what certain individuals were doing directly before the shooting? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, the group of students you identified as, as Hannah, Kylie, and Riley, did you know what they were doing? Yeah, they were just standing there dancing and laughing, it appeared, and choking. All right, thank you. I've got the third. Cross. Can we approach around? Sure. Microphone here. Yeah, could you guys turn on the mic off?
continue tonight at 9 o'clock in the morning. The reason is I'll explain to you more later when we meet. Um, so, uh, much like I said at lunchtime, you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone because you're in the middle of testimony right now. So, I'm going to have you come back in about quarter to nine tomorrow. We'll start at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning with cross examination. Okay. All right? All right, so you can step down. When, when we excuse you, we are doing uh, work. We were here uh, quite a while last night. But I, I don't like to make you wait while we're doing other things. So um, we're, there's a lot of moving parts, so I uh, want to let you go. All right? Um, I need to tell you that during the trial, you should not read, listen to, or watch any news reports about the case. Under the law, the evidence you consider to decide the case must meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth, and the lawyers must be able to examine them. Because news reports do not have to meet these standards, they could give you incorrect or misleading information that might unfairly favor one side. So to be fair to both sides, you must follow this instruction. Do not go on social media, do not post, don't do research, don't discuss the case with anyone. Um, we're going to start up at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Does anybody have any questions about the schedule or anything in general? What time do you need here? Well, we'll start at 9, 5 to 9. Okay. I'll, I'll not either. Um, no, but we'll start at 9. So you guys, you guys are really good today about coming on time. I appreciate that. So. You know, sometimes they, you know, they want to set their camera up and there's all you know, I'm here. But we're moving a lot of people around. All right? So, um, and the court, and we have to go through security. There's all those things. So, uh, it takes some time. So, we'll go all day tomorrow. We're making really good time. I can tell you that. Uh, anybody have any other questions about the schedule? Any other questions about the schedule? Oh, I forgot to order you to stay healthy, right? <laughs> All right. And um, we'll start up again tomorrow night. All right? All right. All rise for the jury. the issue with this. All right, you may be seated. Uh, right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they can go. I'm going to let the jurors go. Thank okay. you. There are no jury instructions issues anymore, right? No, we agreed a few months ago. Right? Yeah.
Good afternoon, Your Honor. David Williams. Good afternoon. Would we call this a motion? Is that... Judge, I think it is. It's an oral motion. Okay. Your Honor, before we get started, I'm just going to place my objection on the record that this is being handled. That, that this is being handled? Yes, especially in front of the media in the middle of a trial, when this is obviously very likely going to be put out in the public, Your Honor. Well, I do have a concern about that. Judge, I was not certainly asking for it to be in front of the media, but I don't know how to make a record without that. Well, we've learned that. It's called 8.119. May I, Judge? Well, I guess I'm wondering, during the course of the trial, if there is any kind of a stipulation that could be agreed to. Certainly, I'm happy to discuss what my request is, Judge. Well, Ms. Lane, would you be willing to have a discussion with the prosecutor's office? I can't, I have to hold the public court now. Correct, Your Honor. I do not want to impact your client or your case in any way by doing so, so I'm waiting for the rights of the parties, so. I would be more than happy to speak with the prosecutor's office about this. Judge, I'm going to be very brief. I think the situation could be temporarily taken care of with a stipulated order, but I don't know if that's satisfactory or not. I'm reluctant to impact the rights of the parties during a jury trial. I mean, Judge, my request is pretty straightforward, and it's pretty time-limited. Well, I know what your request is, but I'm concerned about statements that might be placed on the record, right? Aren't I concerned about that? I am, Your Honor. I mean, Judge, I think it's appropriate for the record, and obviously the jury's not present, that's why they're not here, but I understand what the court's raising. I'm not... All right. Well, I know you do. I know you do. I know you understand my concern as well. I do. Hold on just one second, Judge. I'm asking if there's another method during the duration of the trial, which is about the next week or so. That's exactly it, Judge. Okay, so I'm asking if you and defense counsel could enter into a stipulation. I provided a draft order, Judge. There was a draft order provided, Your Honor. It is not time-specific. It appears to be kind of a blanket time period. Judge, I would... I can set this for a motion the second there is a verdict, right? In fact, Judge, I think we'd be willing to have the order expire by its own terms upon a verdict. We're just talking about during the pendency of the trial. Okay. The client's shaking his head. I don't want to... That's fine. In theory, I can ask the prosecutor to file a written motion, but that doesn't help me either. And, Judge, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Your Honor, my client is not willing to agree to the order. Okay, so... It's basically restricting his ability to speak to people, Judge. I mean, it's a complete revocation, except for counsel. I'm most concerned about him being able to talk to you. Right, and absolutely, that's not part of what we're asking. I mean, Judge, if the order gets entered, we're asking that the communications be limited to only counsel and legitimate clergy during the rest of the trial. That's my request. We're talking seven or eight days. You can talk to his attorney. You can talk to legitimate clergy. Okay, so if he doesn't agree to it, then the prosecutor is going to make their motion. And I have advised Mr. Crumbly of that, Your Honor. I would propose that there could be a different order with a restriction and not a complete revocation. Obviously, the prosecutor's office is reviewing communications. They would know whether or not the order was violated, and at that point, if the court needed to take action, then the court could take action. Judge, it's not just about violations going forward. It's about the conduct that's already happened. Well, I understand that. I understand that. 
it, it, it's so hard to understand because there's a big old sign right there, right? It's not every call. Yeah. Every single call. Yeah, okay. Judge, if there's not an agreement, I, I'd like to just make my motion. It's, it's fairly brief, Judge. So, Ms. Lander, what's, what's his position? Your Honor, he is not agreeing to the order. Okay, well, does he know that, that in 10 minutes there's going to be a, an article about it? Does he know that in 10, maybe 8? I, I can't hear, I'm, I'm not going to have a closed courtroom unless you're proceeding with a closed hearing under 8.19. And as I sit here right now, I don't know if it's called by, so. May I speak with Mr. Williams for one moment? Yeah, you can step out of the room. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. make a record. This is obviously the order is going to become public. The agreement is going to be that um, Mr. Crumbly's communications will be uh, revoked, but not his ability to do research or otherwise participate in his own uh, defense. So not just communicating with counsel, but his ability to read or get other information. Okay. Simply communications. And so, that's, that's going to be a stipulated order between you and Ms. Lane. Correct. All right. And... Did you say that that order would expire upon the verdict? Yes, Judge. Okay. And, and, I, it, and perhaps what, it should go without saying. One? What if there isn't one? Well, I, I think 
Would you like I mean, to we can address it at the time. Okay. I, I think the issue is once there's a verdict, a lot of the issues just fall away. Okay. Um, and I judge it should go without saying, but uh, I hope the court will encourage Mr. Crumley that the, the conduct that got us here. I, I think I already did through his attorney. Okay, had several thank you. Uh, both in, pri in private meetings that we conducted. And I say private, I mean with both uh, the prosecution and the defense. And for the record, I've also addressed it here. I know you have. So. I gave out free legal advice, Mr. Crumley. So someone can take it or not take it, right? So, so I'll sign the stipulated order. Yeah, okay. Good. I didn't sign it. Stuff in the closet or no, uh, no, I actually I could if you don't mind. Yeah, I can. 